Jason Williams, the 352 hitter, will lead it off. The MVP of the South 2 Regional when he hit 647 and had five RBIs. He's been a starter on the 93 National Championship team. Deep to right center. In the gap. And it's gone. The wind shifted dramatically from yesterday to today. It's blowing about 15 miles an hour out to right, and Jason Williams has his sixth home run. Well, he took advantage of that first pitch. High fastball, he drove it to right center field, and no doubt about it, the wind did help him. The wind helps on this ball. He drives it out there, but at first it looked like it was just going to be a gapper, but it just kept going. He carried it into the first row. Mike Kerner has a little low bridge. Well, I guess he wants people to know that he is still out there, even though <laughs> he gave up that first pitch home run. Kerner in at 311. What a dramatic start for LSU under Skip Bertman. They have always been able to swing the bats. This one's fouled out of play down the left field line. One of the things that Bertman has done is looking at his lineup. He has right, left, right, left, right. You know, he uses he mixes them up there is try to keep the pitcher from having two or three left handers in a row so he can get in a groove foul straight back 0 and 2 paired with the 91 strikeouts in 98 and a third innings The 0 and 2 is smacked in the right for a base hit. So two batters, two base hits for LSU. And now we get to the heart of the power, starting with Nathan Dunn. There's a side on breaking ball, but it hangs up high. And Turner just rolls his hands over and lines at the right field for a base hit. Dunn stands in at 364, tied for second on the club with 21 homers, tied for second with 78 RBIs. He's also drawn 56 walks this year. He doesn't chase a lot of bad pitches. Throw over to McCullough. Well, what a tough start for senior Brandon Baird. And they have outscored their opponents 109 to 20 in the first inning this season. They have something else going for them. They're wearing those yellow jerseys. They started wearing those in the regional form three out of four times, and each time they wore the yellow jerseys, it was almost a walkover. The only game they had that was close, they didn't wear them. So they broke them out again for the series. Who says superstitions don't work? <laughs> They're not inside with a fastball. They're not really a running ball club. They really depend on their power, so... They're going to make sure that they give themselves every opportunity to hit the ball out of the ballpark with some men on base. They're not going to get many base runners thrown out attempting the steal. Although Kerner is the number one, 23 out of 25, didn't have much of a lead there. This is fouled back. Skip Bertman is one of those guys, he says, we'll steal when I'm sure we can make it. Yes. But I think in this situation, especially since they're off to a good start, he wants to let his hitters hit, find out if they're going to need to steal any base. They may not need to steal any. Two and one, Nathan Dunn, the junior from Pell City, Alabama. Caught the corner inside, two and two. Dunn, when the College World Series is over, will be going to the Olympic trials with his coach. And it was a first team all SEC selection this year. Throw over and Kerner dives back. The outfield really not looking for Dunn to pull the ball. Center fielder Randy Young shaded toward left center. Even with the power he has. Another throw over. Hey. 
they see the shadows that cut across the field between the pitcher's mound and home plate. In a lot of places, that's a bill, real bother, but here it's not quite as dark behind the plate. 2 2 just missed. Just. And Baird wanted that one. He needs to have something go his way here. Let's take a look at this a breaking ball. There you see the sidearm breaking ball that I don't know what the call was, whether it was high or whether it was outside, but it was a ball. The 3 2. Kerner's not going. And it's on the corner of breaking ball. So he may have gotten the advantage of the call after not getting it on 2-2. Two -two. Well, this breaking ball starts outside, and it definitely comes over the plate. I was watching this one. I got a good view of that. It did come over the plate. And you see the rotation. That's, it has a slider spin on it, actually. But they're, you know, it called it a breaking ball, just a breaking ball. A slider spin has more side spin as that one had curveball a little more downward spin pretty flat breaking ball to throw to a right hander exactly furnace 26 homers 102 RBIs first team all-american SEC player of the year sophomore from Nacogdoches Texas and we mentioned that he had tied the conference record for RBI is 102. If he adds one tonight, he will set the record. To break uh, Todd Walker, Walker, the former uh, All-American second baseman for LSU. But the point is, his all of his statistics will still count, whereas everyone else is that are not that they finished their season. Ben Thomas is already up in the Wichita State bullpen. Here in the top of the first. Good fastball from Baird. One and one. Actually, he's throwing a little harder than I was led to believe. Yeah. He has a pretty live fastball there. That was 85, but as we mentioned last night, those uh, left-handers seem yeah. to get the ball up there a little quicker than the gun would indicate. Well, that definitely looked faster than 85. Yeah. <laughs> well, it did to Eddie Furnace. Breaking ball. Didn't get a good swing at it. One and two. And those shadows may be bothering them a little more than I realize because it just doesn't look as dark down there as it does in a lot of major league stadiums. So it doesn't look like you should have a problem if he swings and misses that breaking ball. He was way out in front of that one. That one actually went down a little bit as well. One and two to Furnace. One on, one out. A run already in on a leadoff home run. Hey. And a throw over. Turner not getting much of a lead on Baird over there. Here's the one two. Instead, another throw over. This is really our first chance to talk about the sun field in right, and it is a big factor right now with the sun about an hour and a half from going down right fielder just doesn't want anything hit right at him on a line strike call on a breaking ball he struck him out nice pitch from Brandon Baird well after giving up the home run and a single he's regrouped to get two strikeouts with the breaking ball here's that sidearm breaking ball that he throws Furnish thinks that it it's outside and I'm gonna agree with Furnish on that one <laughs> now you can see that ball breaks off the corner outside but too close to take. Plate umpire Randy Crystal in his eighth College World Series liked the location. And this is Chad Cooley, the left fielder. Oh. Two out now and one on. I believe in that old adage if it's close with two strikes, you're supposed to swing. Got to be going, don't you? Yeah. Cooley made the all regional team in the NCAA playoffs. Slap towards short. Sorensen to Hooper for the easy force at second. So two hits, but one run on the leadoff homer from... On the infield, Furnace at first, Warren Morris at second, Jason Williams, the four-year starter shortstop, Nathan Dunn at third base, and around the outfield, Cooley, Kerner, and Justin Bowles in right field. 
You know, Joe, we, when we get descriptions of players from the, where the star... Randy Young, the senior center fielder, will lead it off, and this club is loaded with seniors, guys who passed up a chance to play in the bigs in order to come back for exactly this opportunity to win a College World Series title. You have to admire that, too. And a lot of them were still disappointed from 93, and they wanted to give it one more shot. If you could steal first base, this guy would already be in the big leagues. He leads the nation for the second year in a row. 66 stolen bases. Wow, that one straight back. Had a good cut at a fastball. Well, he has been improving in the fact that he's cut down on his strikeouts. You know, he's been able to try to put the ball in play a little bit more. But you're right. If he can get on base, he usually takes second quickly. Down in the dirt, one and two. Yarnell leads the staff in both walks and strikeouts. Fastball chopped foul. Trying to make this young man a switch hitter in 94. And it just didn't work. And at that point, he didn't want to do it. And Gene Stevenson says, if a player doesn't want to do it, there's no point in keep keeping uh, keep trying. Wow, and that's straight correct. back. I mean, a player has to have his heart in it because there's going to be a lot of tough moments while you're going to struggle a lot early. And uh, a great example is Maury Wills. He, was, he would have never made it to the major leagues if he would have not have changed and became a switch hitter and of course I'm sure young speed influenced that uh, that right. idea you'd like to have him on the left side of the plate get that extra step just it back out of play well so far he's holding true to form he's been able to fight off a lot of pitches after two strikes before he used to chase a lot of pitches out of the strike zone and strike out too much now he has learned to you know fight those pitches off Coming off a good regional, too. Hit 438, had a couple of home runs. This one's downstairs, two and two. And he's making Eddie Yarnall work to the first hitter here in the bottom of the first inning. Lined foul. And you can see he's just up there trying to make contact, which is the job of a leadoff hitter. Let's put it in play. This will be the ninth pitch to the opening batter, Randy Young. From Derby, Kansas. Trying to get on and get something started. 3-2. When you foul off a lot of pitches from a, from a pitcher, he always feels like he's got to put a little extra on one to get you out. And when he does that, he usually misses the strike zone. Here's the 3-2. Lost him. Nice call, Coach. Well, that's, that happens quite <laughs> often. You foul off a few balls. So I got to get a little more on it. And he ends up throwing it high and wide. Well, Tim Lanier had better get ready to discard that face mask because Randy Young down at first is 66 out of 72. Reaching out there to get the best lead he can. <laughs> Travis Wyckoff stands in. Fastball outside. Wyckoff, as we mentioned earlier, was the starting pitcher in the 93 championship game. He gave up a home run to Todd Walker as LSU beat them eight to nothing. Downstairs, 2-0. Oh. Well, Young act like he was going on that pitch. He broke, but he didn't feel like he had the jump he wanted, so he stopped. Now, he's worked the count to a good hitting position for Wyckoff. I'm not so sure he should be running here. Wyckoff not with a lot of power, but he's a 4-10 hitter. Ball three. And Yarnell has lost the plate. Well, you can see, I mean, that this is a Randy Young influence here. 
First, he fought him off at the plate, got a base on balls, and now he's aware of him at first base. 3-0 miss. So he's walked the first two batters. Forty-two walks and a hurt, hundred thirteen and the third innings coming in. And he puts Casey Blake in a great spot with runners at first and second, Young at second, Wyckoff at first, and Blake stands in as the club leader with 21 homers, 97 RBIs. Drafted last year by the Yankees, another player who decided to come back. Fastball is in there. And if you're LSU, you have to be aware of the fact that they will steal third base. And I think they are aware of it because the shortstop is staying is over closer to second base than he normally would be, which is opening up that hole on the left side. Young dives back, no throw. again in behind the runner. Now we've got a runner stealing second and Young is hung up between second and third. He wasn't going. Catcher runs right at him and they'll tag him out. Somebody blew a sign because Wyckoff was coming off of first. Young was not coming off of second and Gene Stevenson can only shake his head. Well it really doesn't matter whether Young missed the sign or not. First of all, you do not run a runner off the bag. You can't run until you see the runner in front of you go. So this is not Young's fault, even if he missed the sign. Wyckoff cannot run him down. See, he runs him off of the bag. And the catcher, smart, just runs right at him. And they finally tag him out. So big break right there for LSU. Instead of runners at first and second, nobody out. Now a runner at second, one out, and a 2-1 count to Casey Blake. And the dangerous base runner is off of there. Blake fists it toward third. Nathan Dunn bobbled it twice and has to eat it. Dunn may have been looking at Wyckoff at second to check him, but Wyckoff's not going to be coming on that play. No. Yeah, I think he just bobbles it a little bit. Let's see how he, he waits on it a little bit. Well, he got in pretty good position. The ball just jumped at him. He didn't quite try to catch it out front. If he'd reach, he needs to he count it right at his body. He needs to catch that ball a little bit out front. Extend his arms out front. Catch everything in front of you. So the team's trading favors right now. The 19th error this year on Nathan Dunn down at third. That happens before the base running mistake. Yeah, the base is loaded. Adam McCullough, 343, another power hitter, 15 homers this year. Foul tips that one back to the screen, one and one. Well, when you're an aggressive team as Wichita State, as you will make some mistakes on the base pass. You'll run into outs, you'll make some mistakes by on a hit and run, may miss the ball a little bit, but that's what you do. If you're an aggressive team, you put pressure on the other team and eventually it will pay off. Foul back off the right side, well back into the stands. One and two to Adam McCullough. Became the first baseman this season after spending the first three years of his career as a catcher in DH. In fact, he was the starting catcher in the 93 championship game. Sit on the ground outside of third foul. Oh, what a difference in the weather in 24 hours. It was absolutely perfect tonight. Yeah. One two is fouled straight back over the roof and McCullough is making Yarnell throw a lot of pitches as well. Yeah he is throwing quite a few pitches here in the first inning. It's 23 so far.
Arnold, an experienced player, used to being out there, 111 and a third innings pitched this year. And right back up the middle. One and two. A six to three double play as Jason Williams finishes the inning. McCullough bangs into a double play, and LSU at the end of one has a one nothing lead on Wichita State. Great sports. Way out a part of it, and a double play erased the rest. Brad Wilson, the DH, will lead it off. He's coming off a huge regional, too. 438. Academic honor roll student. Graduated already in general studies. Seen more and more graduate students playing baseball, either uh, coming back for their senior year or their fifth year as a senior. And that's one of the rules that I when they changed it, I thought was good. The guy should be able to use up his eligibility and even if he was able, you know, if he graduated. Yeah, that one made sense to me, too. Yeah. Two and one to Wilson, the senior from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Facing Brandon Baird. Three and one. Actually, I still have my basketball eligibility. <laughs> Got any calls lately? No. <laughs> no? <laughs> In there, 3 2. Yeah, I like that rule, too. You know, you can actually uh, play pro sports in one sport and come back and uh, play amateur in the other. Yes. Balls pop foul, out of play. I think before the evening's over, the fact that they decided to start the left-hander Barrett, I think he will have some success against some of these left-handers in the lineup. I think he will cut down on their successful you know them being successful on pulling the ball because the ball is the wind's blowing out the right field and you definitely do not want many balls hit that way and the fact that he's left-handed I think he'll force some of these left-handers to go the other way oh, we already saw the home run it looked like uh, there might have even been a play on the ball in the gap but it just carried and carried and carried to reach the first row of the seats so you definitely do not want the, these five left-handers in the LSU lineup to be able to pull the ball. So the fact that he has a left-hander out there, I think, will help him in that respect. There's somebody who hasn't used up his eligibility yet, young man. Hit the straightaway center field. Randy Young drifts in and makes the catch. One gone. Tomorrow afternoon, live from Detroit, the Super Bowl of hydroplane racing. Speeds of up to 150 miles an hour at the Chrysler Jeep APBA Gold Cup. Joe Morgan will not be participating. You still have some eligibility left in that, don't you? No. <laughs> I used all that. Now, Joe Theismann loves that stuff, but you couldn't get me one of those boats at 150 for nothing. You Welcome to the club. I'll go with you. <laughs> Justin Bowles takes a breaking ball in there for a strike. Another senior out of Lake Jackson, Texas. Baird missed inside with that curveball. Two and one to Bowles with Tim Lanier on deck for LSU. Line through in right field. Bowles, who was only three out of 13 in the regional, starts the College World Series with a solid single to right. Take a look at the difference between the two pitchers. If you look now, Barrett, he stands on the first base side of the rubber and he steps to that right hole over there, the one on the right side. Yarnell steps right down, Yarnell steps right down the middle. See the hole just to his right there. He will step over and give you a crossfire delivery where Yarnell comes straight at the hitter. 
Runner goes, pitches inside. Here's the throw from Nathan Reese. Not in time. Justin Bowles gets his 11th steal in 12 tries this year. Well, he gets a great jump. I think he goes, no, he didn't go on, con on the first move. He actually read the pitcher's motion, and he got a good jump. No chance to throw him out. The one thing about a left hand, if you read his motion, you're able to steal because they're slower to the plate than most right-handed pitchers. Their motion is naturally slower. Strike called on Lanier, one and one. Runner at second, one gone. We're at the top of the second inning. LSU already leading it, one nothing. Watch him step into the hole. This is on, see how he steps toward first base and throws across his body. That makes it difficult to pick him up. Plus, it makes the left that makes it tough for a left hander to stay <laughs> in there. Yeah. Hit the outside part of the plate with a fastball, one and two. But it gives him a great angle for, to come in on the right-handed hitter because he's throwing like a crossfire motion. It also bothers the right-hander to pick up the ball as quickly as he would like. He can't pick the ball up because he steps over, and all you see is his shoulder first, and then here comes the arm. One and two to Lanier. Baird steps off. Bowles had a pretty good jump at second base then, and he was actually timing him like he was going to try to get some movement before he actually started to the plate. Breaking ball foul out of play. If you're a pitcher, really all you want to do or need to do is stop the guy at second base. You know, when you see a runner steal second, third base, it's because they're really still moving. You know, walkingly. Walkingly. You can't start, go from a dead stop and steal third base too often unless you can fly, but you can't. Your, your chances are not good. You have to have a walking lead or at least be moving or starting that way. Counts stuck at one and two. The number's on Baird. He's thrown 33 pitches so far. Lanier takes it outside. Two and two. Lanier is another one of those guys uh, who has combined baseball with academics. 3.6 grade point average in kinesiology. I'd have enrolled for that, but I couldn't spell it on the <laughs> sign-up card. <laughs> Runner goes. Ball is outside. The throw to third. Not in time. And Justin Bowles has stolen both second and third. And he picked a good pitch to run on that big, slow curveball. And he was trying to time him. As I mentioned earlier, he gets the jump he wants. And it's a big, slow curveball. He chooses the right time to go. There's a big, slow curveball outside. Long catch and throw across his body from the catcher. And he's not able to get him out. Just a good jump there. So Lanier now with a chance to get an RBI if he can just get the bat on the ball somewhere with a 3-2 count. And Baird lost him. So runners at first and third. One gone here in the top of the second. And sometimes base stealers are so distracting to pitchers that they lose track of their primary objective, which is to get the hitter out. Well, everyone thinks that a base stealer only helps you when he steals a base. That's not true. Base stealers take some of your concentration away from the hitter so it obviously helps the hitter when the pitcher is only giving them 80 or 90 percent of their concentration. I I'm watching Baird and the fact that he stands on the extreme first base side of the rubber he gets more tail on his ball to the outside and he seems to be missing there with the right handed hitters. Warren Morris takes a breaking ball high. This is the young man who had surgery on a broken bone in his hand. Still not 100%. That's why he's hitting in the number nine hole, but his average is back up to 387. And when he has started a game this year, LSU is 18 and 0. So actually, without him, they're only a 30 and 15 ball club. And Skip Bertman is delighted to have him back. What was his comment? He said, without him, you'd be talking to the Georgia Tech coach now. That's right. Because <laughs> they would not have beaten them in the regionals with all probability. Morris was a starter for Team USA last year. We'll be going to the Olympic trials when the series is over. 
throw over to first. Actually, he came back. Just one of the fans out here on a beautiful evening. He came back to play in the regionals and celebrated by going seven for 17 and making the all-regional team. This one's hit to straightaway center. Young has a beat on it, but Bowles will tag at third and score easily. Lanier has to hold at first, and it's 2-0 LSU. So Morris gets the RBI. Good job by Morris. He waited on the slow curveball and just made sure he hit it in the air. With a runner at third, you, that's your first priority to get the ball to the outfield. Back to the top of the order, and Jason Williams, who went to right center and lined a home run, wind aided into the first row of seats. That was on the first pitch from Brandon Baird. the fists but still carrying very very well the deep right field Jerry Stein will make the catch that's the end of the inning but LSU posts another run and after one and a half the Tigers have a two nothing lead H Jeff Ryan will lead it off in the second fastball from Yarnell is in there Ryan close to 400 a good athlete has good bat speed. Ah! O2 is low. Let's take a look at where Yarno steps as compared to Barrett. He steps straight ahead, as you can see. That's his on the left hand side he steps straight ahead and because he comes more three quarters when he gets a big stride off that mound yes too. he does sometimes pitchers overstride and their arm lags behind strike three call Yarnell is eighth in the nation in strikeouts per inning pitched and he really comes after people. And you can see Skip Bertman giving some signs there. Jerry Stein, the right fielder, stands in, takes one on the corner, 0 and 1. A lot of the coaches here call the pitches, you know, for their mm -hmm. catchers. Stein, one of the few players in the series who really struggled coming in. In the regional, he was only one out of 15. His hit was a home run. Line drive hitter now facing an 0 and 2 count in the dirt. Junior college transfer. He's been a two year starter for Gene Stevenson of Wichita State. Fouls that one back out of play. Bottom of the second, two nothing LSU. Just missed. Tell you what, that was a beautiful pitch right there, in that he had to hit her off balance. If he swings at it, there's nothing he could do with it. He had changed speeds. This is a slower breaking ball than the first one. You see how he keeps, he does something really well. I'll talk about it in a second. Line to the gap in right center field. Extra bases. Stein on his way to second. Kerner picking it up in center field will hold it to a double. Stein got an 0-2 hole and then was able to work it back and rip one. Well, it showed me that he was seeing the ball pretty well by the fact that he took the pitch before. 
This is a fastball up and in, and he drills it. That's a tough pitch to handle when you're down two strikes from a left-hander, but he finds the gap, and for a moment there, he thought about going for three. Right about here, he's going to go for three, and then, ah, better hold up here. We've already made one mistake. Let's not make some more. <laughs> That's right. His 22nd double of the season to bring up Nathan Reese, the catcher, a junior from Shawnee Mission, oh. Kansas. First team all Missouri conference. Hitting 351 on the year, hit 333 in the regional. Drastically closed stance. Oh. There are a lot of people who believe, if, you know, if you close your stance, it helps keep your front shoulder in. I believe just the opposite because no matter who you are, you're going to step away a little bit. And if there's a right-handed pitcher out there, a lot of times you keep going. Watching him, though, he does a good job of stepping straight back to the pitcher. In the air down the right field line in foul territory, twisting and unreachable. But the point is, if you step straight ahead, it doesn't matter where you start. Mm -hmm. So let's see where he steps. See, that's a good stride. He keeps right there he keeps his shoulder in there and I'm sure that's why he starts with a closed stance because maybe when he was with a square stance his front shoulder was flying out and he does this to keep it in and what you're saying is he ends up with a square stance he ends which up is what you have to right, do with a perfect stance blowing outside with a fastball three and one to Reese but the only problem I have is the more you exaggerate your stance the more you exaggerate things the more movement there is in between. You know, even though he ends up with a square stance, there's a lot of movement with his body to get to that square stance. Foul down the right side. And when you start moving your body, especially your upper body, and your head starts to move, it's very difficult to stay on the pitch. And that's one of the reasons you do not see as many exaggerated stances in the major leagues because. Mm -hmm. You can't have that big a margin for error, margin of error there by moving all over the place. Three and two. Struck him out. Beautiful fastball that tailed away toward the outside corner. 90 miles an hour on the gun. Now watch this fastball. It goes away from him, and he's a little late on it as well. Fastball right on the outside corner. And you can see he was late. But you see where he stepped away to get square, and then the ball's away. You've got to try to lean back out there. I mean, I just think it's a difficult stance to hit from because there's... And it doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means it makes it more difficult to hit from that stance. This is Zach Sorensen, the freshman shortstop, with one on and two out. In the bottom of the second. Sorensen hitting 309. Drafted out of high school by the Orioles. Chose to attend college instead. Fouls this one out of play down the right side. Not too many people getting around on the fastball of Eddie Yarnell. And you see the sun in right field. It's just wicked out there for a right fielder, especially something that's hit just above the crest of the uh, pavilion at the stadium. You see, it's clearing up around home plate, though. The shadows are not covering the plate as they were at the beginning. Check the swing, one and two. And, then, you know, and I want to go back to Nathan Reese's stance. See, there's a lot of people have different feelings about how to approach the pitch, and there's not any one set stance or any one set way to approach it. You know, you do it the best way you can or the way that you feel most comfortable, and obviously he feels comfortable in that stance. I haven't seen anybody up here uh, flexing one arm at the plate yet, though. <laughs> yeah, that's what I say. Everyone has a different approach, so <laughs> whatever works. You think... You'd think there'd be a thousand little kids out there doing that, wouldn't you? Uh, well, when I was playing in Cincinnati, there were. <laughs> Here's the 2-2 inside, full count to Sorensen. That's like watching a golf tournament. You see somebody with an odd putting stance. They yes. make five or six. The next day on a golf course, there's 800 guys <laughs> with the same stance. And you're right, golf is similar to baseball in that respect. That you can do it your own way. You never see two swings similar in this game or that one. Lost Sorensen outside. So runners at first and second, and Hooper will have a chance to come up. The number nine man in the order. One of the things that Stevenson said to me, he said, 
Hooper, we were talking about size yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Hooper weighed 129 pounds when he first came there. He said he was just so tiny, it was unbelievable. But he said he had a lot of confidence in his ability, and he's proven to be a very fine player. He's one of those kids that is really tough, and if you start at 129 pounds and you're going to yeah. play major college baseball, you better be tough. But there, I think the, the good thing there is on base average, 434. That means that he will accept the walk and finds a way to get on base. And made collegiate baseball freshman All-American team. Hitting 313 right now. You send a couple of those up here if you want. Quickly. <laughs> Strike called from Eddie Yarnell. Cooper still listed at uh, 129 pounds, although they say he's gained a little weight. Yeah, I don't know where. <laughs> well, he's taller than we are anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I am uh, taller than I am anyway. Yeah, don't include me on that one okay. quite yet. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure he's tougher, though. Yeah, he's tough. In an 0-2 hole. No. Just missed. Nice 0-2 pitch there by Yarnell. He tried to nip the outside corner or at least move it out that way and try to get Hooper to chase it. You see the catcher is actually set up a little bit outside. Yeah, just off the corner. Nice call. Line through base hit. Stein will come to the plate. Furness unloads. He was playing very shallow in right field and he got to that base hit in a hurry and ripped it in. Well, where are you going to play 129 pounds? Absolutely. Kid? And a smart play here by Furness and he turns it loose. He lets it go all the way in the air, a little bit off target. But you can see that he makes the catch, dives out, and he tags him. 2 nothing. end of two. I mean, with two down, always send the run. I mean, 90% of the time, they will send the runner. So that's not a mistake. It's just a good play on, on LSU's part. Kerner a little late on the swing. Strike one. He is one for one single to right his first time up. In the last 14 games, he's 22 for 54. Hitting over 400. For two. Kerner starts the LSU third with a ringing single off of Brandon Baird. Looks like he really waits well on the ball. Now watch him use his hands. Right there. Nice hitting there. He didn't try to pull that pitch. Ball's out over the plate. Just slaps it that way using nothing but hands. He didn't really use his lower body or anything. Just lined it over shortstop. Kerner, the number one base stealer on the club with 23 out of 25, and Nathan Dunn stands in. He was called out on strikes his first time up. Throw over by Brandon Baird. Jim Mann was number two in the SEC with 78 RBIs. He was number two in the SEC with 21 homers. Only Furnace had more, and that broke the SEC record with 26. Not a bad regional either. has yet to get a big lead, although he's stretching it out a little bit here and two times aboard. And Baird may have not shown him his A move yet, but uh, he doesn't look real quick to first. Well, I was going to say that the only thing about Baird, he doesn't 
really take his right foot behind the rubber, which was a real clear indicator that he's going home. If you lift your leg straight up, you can always come to first base. But a lot of left-handed pitchers will take their right leg and their foot goes past the rubber going when they kick it back. If they kick it back past the rubber, they have to go home or it's a ball. But he does a good job of just lifting it straight up. 0-2 to Dunn with Kerner at first. Nobody out here in the LSU third. Yeah, he lifts it straight up, and then he can go to first base. And that's probably confusing Kerner a little bit. You don't see many balks called at the College World Series. You get a little leeway here. So far, he's doing a good job of holding him close without balking. Mm -hmm. So maybe he will give him his balk move in a second <laughs> and pick him off. Huh? Slow breaker nearly caught the outside corner. Baird wanted that pitch. Tough one to take. Tough one to take. But I think he took it because he was fooled, not because <laughs> he thought it was a ball. See, we all times we think that people take those pitches because they think they're outside. No, sometimes you take a pitch because you couldn't swing at it. <laughs> you couldn't hit it. One and two. Chop back up the middle. Hooper will take it himself at second throw and drop by the first baseman, Adam McCullough. So Kerner is out on the force, but Dunn reaches. Well, nice play. And that's what it, we were talking about before about this infield. Here's Marsh. He comes across, throws, makes a perfect throw. Ball's just dropped at first base. Watch me come across. Marsh tags the bag. One extra step. And the throw is right on target. Oh, just clank. Just yeah, it's just clank. Okay, good idea. Now keep in mind that McCullough was uh, the DH and the catcher, but they have been very pleased with what he has done at first base. He's played much better in the games than he had ever shown them in practice. Furnace up with one on and one out. He was called out on strikes his first time up. Dunn can also steal a base down there. He's 18 out of 20. The number's on Furnace, currently hitting 379. Down zone. Side arm. Let's go to Larry Connolly. Larry? I got sitting here with Ed Furnace Jr., who is the father of Eddie Furnace. And Ed, I know you spent a lot of time with him as he was growing up, coaching him in Little League Baseball, but I also heard that you hired a lot of guys to come over and pitch to him who were a lot older, making him a better hitter. Uh, when he was about five, we started playing and working out. And as he went through the years, we uh, we had a college there that had some college pitchers. And they, I hired one in the summer that mowed the yard in the afternoon and pitched him in the morning. And uh, we uh, put in a lot of hours in the batting cage, and he put in a lot of hours on the field. Mike, another thing, you want to talk about academics? To his left here is his sister, Laura. She is a dermatologist. They also have another sister, or he does, Eddie, Karen, who is going to be a doctor, and he's in pre-med. I don't know if I'm here in the ER, which means Eddie's residency or Eddie's runs. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Larry, thanks very much. That, that's a novel way to do it. You get somebody from college, come over, mow the yard, and then pitch to your son. Yeah, that's a pretty good job. <laughs> I'd let him pitch first. I wouldn't want him all worn out from mowing the lawn. <laughs> Two and one to Furnace, a runner at first, one gone. <laughs> Furnace looks bigger than that uh, that he's listed at 6'4", 205. Yeah, he does look a little larger than 205. Looks like right. he's got some linebacker size yeah. on him there. <laughs> Crossfire missed outside, three and one. 
I believe they're having trouble reading Barrett's motion down there at first base, and that's the reason none of these runners who have a chance to steal a base have taken off. Family would like a nice fat pitch on three and one. Instead, they get a breaking ball inside, and Furnace draws the free pass. Well, he's hit 17 home runs in the last 27 games. You're probably not going to see too many good offerings here. Brent Chemnitz will come out to welcome uh, those discussions, and the others would rather just be done with it and let me pitch. Yes, you're right. But it depends on the pitcher. Sometimes they need to be slowed down just to settle themselves mm -hmm. down. Chad Cooley stands in, 0 for 1. Grounded in will force out. He's trying to break one of Todd Walker's records. Walker hit 61 career doubles for LSU. He only needs two more to break that mark. Way inside. When you start breaking hitting records at LSU, you're breaking some records. Yeah, you're right. They're in Oklahoma State. <laughs> yes, sir. Cooley has some power to right, and that's the way the wind is blowing right now. Takes it downstairs, 2 and 0. Oh. Unfortunately, when you're a young pitcher, as the players are here in the College World Series, and, the, and, you, and a coach comes out and tells you about your mechanics, Sometimes you think too much about your mechanics mm -hmm. and forget that you still have to throw a strike. He needs one now on two and zero with runners at first and second. Way outside three and zero. There you see the shadows are creeping from the other side of the stadium. Before we had shadows over home plate from the backstop. Now they're coming from down the stands on the left field line. Three and zero to Cooley. In there for a call strike, three and one. Gene Stevenson doesn't want to see his team fall any further behind. They're already down two nothing here in the third. World Series situation there's absolutely no reason to let a pitcher go longer than you think he can be effective because you've got your entire staff to work with and you can't afford to fall into the losers bracket this being the opening game for both but I'm sure that there are three or four pitchers on your staff that you have the utmost confidence sure. in, and the others you do not know exactly what you're going to get on any particular day three and one foul straight back but that works that way in the major leagues as well I mean you're not you have ten pitchers maybe in the major leagues but you only have confidence in three or four unless you're the Atlanta Braves <laughs> yeah two runners aboard one out full count to left fielder Chad Cooley the senior from Lake Charles Louisiana Baird trying to get out of trouble again. He's already allowed four hits. Called strike three. And that real slow breaking ball seems to mesmerize the hitters. They stand there and they get frozen at the plate, whether it starts off the plate outside or not. Now watch. Watch the hitter on this. Forget the pitch. Watch the hitter. See his front shoulder go right there? He can't swing. So there's nothing he can do. Watch his front shoulder. It's already gone. There's nothing he can do. He can't pull the trigger. Baird so far, three strikeouts, all called. Brad Wilson, the DH, with two on and now two out. He's 0 for 1. Flew the straightaway center ah! in the second inning. Little guy who can play a lot of different positions for the club, DHing today. 
swinging a miss, strike two. Baird getting the start tonight because he's described as a big game pitcher. He is rarely motivated against average teams. Well, he is facing a big time team here in a big time situation trying to get out of another jam. Line to left, base hit. Wyckoff comes on to field it. Here comes Dunn on his way to the plate. They got a shot, not in time. Nathan Reese arguing that he blocked the plate. But Randy Crystal is not buying any of it. Well, he did block the plate, but he stuck his hand in there. And that's one advantage of diving at the plate. I don't like to see players dive at the plate because your shoulder or any part of your body hits that shin guard. You're going to be in trouble. Now, watch his hand. So he does block the plate, but he sticks his hand in there, and you can see that his hand did go across the plate. Yes, sir. Good call. Here we'll get another, maybe a closer look at it. Nice throw, nice tag. He does block the plate, but watch his hand. See his hand goes right past him there. Now it's on the plate. Now he applies the tag. So a good call by the home plate umpire there. We've had some excellent umpiring so yeah. far. Now Gene Stevenson is out pleading Nathan Reese's case for him. I mean, everyone did what they were supposed to do. Yeah. To, I mean, the guy made a good slide. Again, I don't agree with going head first into the home plate because you can get hurt. But in this case, it worked. And it's probably the only reason he was safe. Here's another look at it. Watch his hand. See his hand, we saw in the close-up view, that his hand actually touches the plate right there, and now he tags him. There it is again. Hand on the plate, now he's tagged. I mean, it's a very close play, but I, I have to agree with the umpire that he made the right decision. We're looking at it in slow motion. <laughs> yeah. And we, we agree with him, so he had to make that decision right away. So 3 nothing LSU, still runners at first and second for Justin Bowles. Yeah. Bowles, the man that made the good throw from right field to cut down a runner to end the previous inning. He's also one for one, single to right. Stole second and third and then scored. And Joe, you're right about that last play. Everybody did exactly what right. they were supposed to do. And there's nothing you can say other than it's just a good play. Breaking ball misses outside. One and one. So LSU has scored single runs in each of the first three innings. And think back to the double play ball that first baseman Adam McCullough dropped that kept this inning going. And the, because of that, the run is unearned. Yeah, well, Dunn is the one that scored it. He should have been out at first base. Exactly. But then again, I don't know if they can call it an error, though, did they? It's a good question, though. One and two to Justin Bowles. Breaking pitch just got a piece of it at the plate. The, the rules say that you do not anticipate the double play. They retired the guy at second base. So the point is, I can't remember if the umpire at first base called him out. If he called him out and you drop the ball, well, then they can they can call him there. But normally, you cannot anticipate a double play. That's what the rules say. Trying to check with the official score to see what the... Uh, reason is I have never liked that rule either because yeah. obviously it was an error on McCullough it was a misplay obviously yeah you're right it was a misplay and it, it bails guys out by a rule but there's another way that, they, that you can handle that that which baseball needs to look at I, I believe in the team error sometimes where the ball bounces away from the throw from the outfield you know so mm -hmm. forth. in this case this was an error I mean there's no doubt you're right I mean he dropped the ball but I mean there are other instances where again where there's no fault of either player 
but someone has to get an error because the runner moves up. Three and two to Justin Bowles. Baird struggling here in the third. He's allowed five hits and three runs in two and two-thirds innings. And has thrown 27 pitches in this inning alone. It's Tim Lanier, the on-deck hitter. Ball four, and Lanier will get a chance to hit with the sacks loaded. And here comes Gene Stevenson. I think he has seen enough from Brandon Baird. Well, I think it's more because he's not able to throw strikes. Gene has a only previous trip, continues to hit 249 on the year. That's foul. One of the team captains for the second straight year for this ball club. Furnace down at third. Wilson is the runner at second base. And Justin Bowles down at first with LSU already up 3-0 and threatening to break it open against relief pitcher Chris Bowers trying to get out of a huge jam. In the dirt. Nice stop by Nathan Reese. That was about a 58-foot fastball. <laughs> You're right. Uh, watch Reese. He just drops down and keeps the ball in front. He actually caught it, but he was going to keep it in front of him with his body. And Stevenson said he's the best defensive catcher he's ever had. One and one from Chris Bauer. Hit a ton to left. Goodbye, Grand Slam. The fifth home run of the year for Tim Lanier. The previous highlight of his batting season had been a career high five RBIs against Georgia Tech in the regional. This one will take first prize. Well, it looked like it was a hanging breaking ball, but it really wasn't. It didn't break. But the speed was slow enough. But you can see that he can get to it, and he just drills it right out of here. Even against the wind, no doubt whatsoever. 7-0 LSU. Lanier in the lineup because of his defense, as Joe mentioned, the best defensive catcher they have probably ever had at LSU. But today, he can say, forget those tools. Look what I did with the stick. He found the hitter. <laughs> Warren Morris who had a sacrifice fly in an RBI his first trip. And Bauer has a good fastball. That's really his strength is his fastball. But he will throw a curve and a change. This is reminiscent of this afternoon's game, Florida, Florida State. A relief pitcher comes in hopefully to put out the fire and instead gives up a grand slam home run. Well, if you're Wichita State, you say to yourself, well, we're down seven runs. The good thing is it's only the third inning. That's the best that you can say about this. You have quite a few innings to make it up. This one's hit in the air to straightaway left. Wyckoff is there. That's the third out of the inning, but the damage is done. Lanier with a grand slam homer, and LSU is on top, 7-0. Brad Wilkerson. Grand slam in the seventh to lift Florida over arch rival Florida State. And in this last inning, the same exact situation. Bases loaded, new pitcher. And that did not look like Bauer's good fastball, but I watched in the rotation on it, it didn't have any spin on it, but it did not look like his good fastball. Go. Randy Young stands in, walked his first time up. And Eddie Yarnell has now been staked to a 7-0 lead. 
and his job will be to so throw strikes and there is Bauer nothing can be more depressing for a relief pitcher than to come in and not only not put out the fire but throw fuel on it as they say he brought a can of gasoline out of the bullpen yeah. with him but that's I mean that's again it just didn't look like that was his best fastball he may have slipped out of his hand he didn't get the grip right but it was not his best fastball one and two to Randy Young Young a much better hit hitter this year with two strikes than he was a year ago. And when you can run like he does, you really got to concentrate on just making some contact, putting the ball in play. Just like that. Yeah, that'll work. Unfortunately, now you're seven runs down. You're not going to be doing a lot of base running or base stealing. This is a fastball, and he just puts the bat on it. Nice level swing and lines it right back through the box for a base hit to center field. We'll bring up Travis Wyckoff, who walked his first time up. Throw over. You can only imagine that Young would be stealing if he was convinced he could make it. As you pointed out, the last thing you'd want to do is run into an out down 7-0. What was the old saying? Well, he may be convinced he can make it, but he, better, <laughs> he still better make it. Yeah, that's right. Another throw over. throw this time and reasonably close this is the heart of the order two three four coming up Wyckoff their best hitter at 410 Young is going and no throw well Gene Stevenson probably told him hey I want you to go anyway and, and part of this is, is smart because it makes your team think that, hey, we can still do the things that we do best. And I think really what happens here is that he forgets about him and he just takes off and he makes it easily. Chop to the right side. Warren Morris will take the easy one. Has it at first. Young goes over to third. Wyckoff is out. Casey Blake will come up. Young down at third with one out. Strike called on one to Blake. Take a look at uh, Tim Lanier. I mean. He, occasionally, watch how he sets up. So he's off the plate outside. He's actually leaning out there. Now he leans back. The ball's on the inside corner. Shot back up the middle, and Morris can't get there. The first run for Wichita State. Young scores on the ground ball single from Casey Blake. And even though we both realize that you can't get someone thrown out when you're down seven to nothing, Gene Stevenson says, "Hey." I have to be aggressive and let my hitters hit. I'm going to let my runners run. Fastball, and he grounds it right back up the middle. It's just good hitting, staying on top of the ball. But so you have to admire what Gene did. I mean, he keep, that keeps his runners and his people uh, thinking aggressively. But when you're seven runs down, you better not make mistakes. I mean, if, you, if he gets thrown out, I mean, you're not going to look very good. But I agree with him in that you want to stay aggressive. It's still early in the ball game. It's still the third inning. And back to a point you made earlier, you have to stick with your nature. You have to be what you are. Hit deep to left, down the line, hooking into the corner. Blake 
is on his way to third. They'll hold him there, and McCullough has a ringing double. And I think this is exactly what Stevenson was trying to do, make sure they stay aggressive, like I say, at the plate and at, on the bases. This fastball is drilled, but it's kind of against the wind, and he didn't get real good extension. He just kind of whipped the bat through the zone. He hit it hard, but he didn't have enough carry on it. But he still gets runners at second and third with only one down. Jeff Ryan, the DH, with a chance to pick up a couple. He was called out on strikes in the second inning. So Yarnell has given up his first run and has runners at second and third. And bounce that one up there. Another good play there by Lanier. Well, the infield's going to play back, so if the ground ball's at any place but third and back to the pitcher, they'll probably score a run. And that's all Ryan is thinking right now. I get the bat on the ball. Big swing and a miss. He may have been thinking a little bit more on that one. Yeah, but he was a little tardy on it, too. <laughs> a little late on that fastball. One and two. Ryan was heavily recruited, projected as freshman of the year in the Missouri Valley Conference. But he broke his hand early in the year and missed six weeks of action. Took a real weak swing at a high fastball, and he's gone. Well, the last thing you wanted there was a strikeout. You just wanted him to put the ball in play. Because as I said, you have a long way to go if you get one here, one there. It'll help you. This is a fastball that just tails away on the outside. Now look how far outside the catcher Lanier is sitting off the plate. Now watch this. See how he jumps way out there? I mean, he's way outside. Jerry Stein takes a breaking ball for called strike one. He doubled in the second inning. And was thrown out trying to score. One and one. Runners at second and third. Now two out. As Wichita State has scored its first run of the ball game, still down seven to one, and they need a base hit here. High ball two. going to get combat pay before this is over. He's done a great job going down in the dirt. And you notice the way he moves his body. He doesn't just try to stick the glove out there. He makes sure he gets in front of it. I think the thing that really helps him to block these pitches, as we've seen, is the fact that he really always catches the ball out in front of him. So he's working out in front. And he can anticipate where it's going. Good cut by Stein. Fouled it straight back. Three and two. Stein, 5'9", 190, a senior from Wichita, Kansas. Gene Stevenson said he has been a very hard worker his whole career. Here's the payoff pitch. Struck him out. Eddie Yarnell works his way out of a jam with his fourth strikeout. He fans the last two men he faces with runners at second and third, and the biggest Wichita State rally of the game produces one run. Williams, one for two, stands in against Chris Bauer, who is pitching his second inning of relief. Williams led off the game on the first pitch with a home run to right. Fastball in there for a call strike, one and one. That's the uh, Hall of Fame room, a picture of George Bush, the then first baseman for Yale. 
They lost that World Series, the inaugural one, to California. Had champions of the East and the West in those days. Mr. Bush was described as a slick fielding first baseman. And as the man who said who struck him out to uh, late in that ball game couldn't hit a lick. <laughs> I don't believe that. Three and two to Jason Williams. Called strike three. Well, Bauer has a very good fastball, so you have to look for the fastball, especially on three and two. He breaks this curve over on the inside corner. Good rotation on that pitch. We, we saw earlier, Baird's breaking ball was flat. That one has a good rotation breaking down as well as across. And a nice job by Nathan Reese of framing it for the umpire. Of course, Bauer has that extra motivation after coming in and giving up the grand slam. He'd like to stay on as long as possible and shut LSU down for as long as possible. Mike Kerner stands in two for two so far on the day. Has his average up to 317. LSU got one in the first, one in the second, a five spot in the third for them coming on Lanier's grand slam. Hit the dead center field, Young. Quickly over to his left to make the catch, and Turner is gone. Two outs in the top of the fourth. I am still deceived by the sound off of that aluminum bat. They all sound like rockets. <laughs> I had not heard that sound for quite a few years. <laughs> it's very unnatural, isn't it? Yes. Nathan Dunn rips it to left. Foul ball. Just hooked outside the line. Well, you can see that the outfielders learned a lesson from Burnham last night. They come up throwing <laughs> and let the umpire make the decision. You see he's smiling out there. <laughs> this ball is hit hard, but you can see it's hooking, and it hooks foul by quite a bit down in the corner. And he comes up and fires a strike, and then he starts smiling. Throw first, ask questions later. Exactly. 0-1 to Nathan Dunn. Swung through a breaking pitch, 0-2. Chops this one outside, third foul. Jim Thomas, the third base coach. Excuse me, Mike Bianco, the third base coach, taking it. Wrap to short. The freshman Sorensen comes up and throws him out. So LSU finally goes quietly here in the fourth inning. To one. Nine to one lead over Wichita State. That is part of the new renovated press box. Cost around $5 million, and they did a magnificent job here at Rosenblatt Stadium. Let's update you on some of the action. Earlier this afternoon, Florida with a grand slam comes from behind to beat Florida State 5-2. to two. Brad Wilkerson with a grand slam. He also got the save. John Coffin of Florida went seven and two-thirds inning. And here are the brackets. Alabama and Miami have already advanced. Clemson and Oklahoma State will meet in the loser's bracket. Florida advanced this afternoon. They'll play the winner of this game between Wichita State and LSU. And the loser will play FSU in the loser's portion of this bracket. Nathan Reese stands in. Hits it hard but well fouled down the right field line. Reese 0 for 1 struck out swinging in the second inning. Reese has to be a pretty good hitter coming in at 351. Uh, they almost uh, teasingly say he hasn't had a leg hit in his career. <laughs> Everything he gets he earns. 
This one's hit hard, but right at the second baseman, Warren Morris, and he'll throw him out. Reese is gone quickly. We're in the bottom third of the order for Wichita State. Their bats came alive a little bit in the last inning, getting a run, but stranding runners at second and third. Sorensen walked his first time up. Honorable mention All-American named by Mizuno this year as a freshman shortstop from Salt Lake City. Tried to punt his way on, but right back to Yarn. Two gone. Well, it's a good idea to try to bunt, try to get something started, but you can see the barrel of the bat drop down and he pops it up. And Yarnell just makes the play. Kevin Hooper, one for one. Single to right. One of these kids with an attitude that nobody is going to tell me I can't play baseball because I love to play baseball. I may be 5'9 and 129 pounds, but here I am. Well, when you're a small guy, you have to work a little harder to prove to the coaches that you can do the job. Up and in, two and one. I can remember Freddie Patek, who played sure. down in Rook, Kansas City. Small shortstop. Most shortstops are not very small. Hit toward the hole. Stabbed by Williams. And he won't even bother with the throw. It's a good decision by Jason Williams not to make the throw and possibly give him an extra base. Hooper is on. He's two for two. That's definitely the right decision. But once the ball bounces that many times and that high in the hole, you really do not have a chance to throw the hitter out. Williams was number one in the Southeastern Conference among shortstops in fielding percentage. But he doesn't make very many mistakes out there. Back to the top of the order for Randy Young, who was one for one with a walk and has scored the only Wichita State run of the evening. Hooper on it first, has good speed. This one's fouled back off the right side. Young now with 67 steals, extending his own number one spot in the NCAA record book for the year. It's that one high, two and one. Yarnell so far has struck out four and walked three, giving up six hits through three and two thirds, but only allowed one run. That's fouled straight back. Sometimes when you look at the line score, you don't get the same impression as you do watching the game, and I have had the feeling that Yarnell has been more in command than that. You're exactly right, but you look at the scoreboard, and he has six hits, the same as the Wichita State hitter pitchers have given up. He was in command right there, his fifth strikeout of the ball game. We've played four at 7-1. to one. There's something... I don't know when that started. It's a good question. <laughs> uh, Lawrence Welk was probably a child at the time. <laughs> Furness will lead off the LSU fifth inning. He's 0 for 1, walked and called out on strikes. There's another guy with that great speed, doesn't get any leg hits. Still hits 380. Check the swing. Whoop. Excuse me. Strike call. Two and one. Three and one. 
the amazing thing is that all these good hitters have very good eyes at the plate. I mean, they do not make a lot of mistakes by ch chasing pitches out of the strike zone. Little dinker to short. And he's out. Sorensen throws across to get Furnace. Tomorrow, coming up for yesterday's Chris Muller's three-run bomb in the last of the night, carried number one Alabama to a dramatic win. The Crimson Tide will take on the Miami Hurricanes in the winner's bracket, and that will be on ESPN tomorrow afternoon, 3.30 Eastern. Then we'll switch to the Deuce, and it's an elimination game between the Oklahoma State Cowboys and the Clemson Tigers. Those are the eight squads that made the golden anniversary field for the College World Series. Cooley standing in against Bauer. Strike call, one on one. Swing and a miss on a breaking ball, one and two. Joe, it's, it's interesting. Coming out here now for as long as I have, we've heard so many players who have gone on to wonderful careers in the major leagues, been part of Major League World Series championships, all-star games, MVP awards, and yet they talk about this event so lovingly and so much as if many of them even say it was the biggest thrill of their career to participate in the College World Series. Well, this is, you know, the top, this is as high as you can get in college baseball. And when you get to the top of any sport that you're involved in, I mean, that's great. I mean, it's like playing in the Major League World Series. I mean, that's the highest you get when you're a college player. And I guess very often that first thrill is the one that right. sticks with you more than others. Cooley draws a base on ball. One on, one out for Brad Wilson, the DH. Wilson stands in one out of two with an RBI and a run scored. He had the game-winning homer to beat Mississippi State in the 10th three weeks ago. One of nine homers he's hit this year. Takes his lead at first and then ducks back. He has 15 steals and 18 tries this year. And if you're Skip Burtman with a 7-1 lead, do you become more aggressive running the bases? Well, I think you just have to do something to keep your kids from relaxing and thinking the game is over. You have to continue to try to score runs. If you get into a laid-back attitude, I mean, that can happen and you will not score any more runs and you give Wichita State a chance to catch up. Cooley has a good lead. And Bauer got really close with that one. Bauer showing some pretty quick feet. When he puts a throw in the right place, too. Hey, settle, Brad. Wilson now 0 and 2 fouled at the plate. At least one rally cap in evidence, even with a 7 to 1 lead. Well, you never know. What could happen in these ball games? So six runs may not be enough. I mean, you never know. I guess one rally cap indicates just a small yeah, rally. Just one, uh, they've got a big lead, so you just <laughs> want a little bit more. Don't want to be too greedy. <laughs> Owen two to Wilson. Bauer, who came on and gave up the grand slam home run, has pitched well since. 
wasted one outside one and two. has done the damage tonight without their three, four, five hitters. Those guys have gone 0 for 7. And still they've posted seven runs in this game. And that shows you just how tough that lineup is from top to bottom. Hit to the gap in right center. Young on his horse has a beat on it and makes the catch. Randy Young, with great speed out there, is going to chase down anything that stays in the ballpark. Well, he got a good jump on that ball, too. And that, to me, that's the key, as well as having blazing speed, to get a good jump on the ball, and he does that. Two gone here in the LSU fifth. Well, we didn't get our last order. You can send up some of those, too. Justin Bowles, nice block by Reese on a ball in the dirt. Bowles one for one, singled and walked. Not only are the sights and sounds around here great, <laughs> the aroma is great <laughs> yes, here is. at this ballpark. Another quick throw from Bauer to check Cooley. The runner at first with two men out. Here in the top of the fifth, LSU on top of Wichita State, 7-1. This one gets away from Reese. And Cooley cruises into second base easily. See how that one's ruled. Got a glove on it. It appeared that he should make the, the grab. Well, the ball was in the air, so they'll usually give the catcher an, a pass ball on that because it did not bounce out front. Checked his swing. Nothing doing on the appeal, and it's 3-0. Nathan Reese looked a little upset with himself as that ball got by. And it is ruled a pass ball. Another one in the dirt and another good block from Reese, even though it was ball four, it kept Cooley from going to third. Let's check in with Larry Conley. Larry, what do you have? Thanks, Mike. I'm sitting here with Hal and Barbara Lanier and Tim Lanier, who's getting ready to walk up to the plate right now. And I want to know just how excited the two of you were when he hit that grand slam home run, Hal. What else could a dad ask for to see his son get a grand slam in the World Series? You know, just great. Yeah, no matter, Barbara. Yeah, I cried. I cried. It was wonderful. Well, it's nice when a guy's hitting around 240 or 250 who steps up and does that, isn't it? Sure is. He really is. He works real hard. And, and it's good to see this club here, huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is one of his dreams. Go three. Mike, I think this is one of the things I enjoy the most, is sitting here talking to the parents after a guy hits a grand slam home run. Larry, absolutely. The smiles on their faces uh, say everything. Of course, you did have that one streak, I believe it was two years ago, when you, uh, Larry Conley was down there speaking to uh, pitchers' parents, and every time he got within three feet of him, somebody hit a 450-foot <laughs> home run. So nobody wanted to talk to Larry after that for a while. Well, that's typical parents there. The father sticks his chest out, and the mom wipes away a That's right. <laughs> Two on, two out for Lanier. Hits another one. This one lined down the left field line. Cooley will score. And a nice job by Travis Wyckoff, the left fielder. He got over and cut it off in a hurry and kept Bowles at second base. But two straight base hits for Lanier and five ribbies. Well, this curveball just kind of hangs in the middle of the plate, and he just rips it over the third baseman's head into the corner. Nice play, as you mentioned, Mike, by Wyckoff. He cut it off and then threw behind the base runner. Almost got him. Talk about a guy who has come on at the right time. Going into the uh, Georgia Tech game, as there's a ball lofted to left field, Wyckoff going back. He won't get there. Warren Morris... 
knocks it into the seats for a ground rule double. And that's going to give them one run and one run only as Lanier has to go back to third. This fastball is up, and he drills it in the left center field over the head of Wyckoff. Wyckoff is going to play it off the wall, but the Wichita gets lucky as the ball bounces into the seat and saves them at least one run for the moment. Wyckoff appeared to take a bad angle on that ball. He ran straight across the left center and then back. Cost himself a couple of steps. But he may not have been able to get to it anyway. Nine one LSU. They have failed to score in only one inning. That was the fourth. And remember, this is against a Wichita State team with the best record in the field, 54 and 9. And the LSU bats have just been cranking it out against Gene Stevenson's pitching staff. Jason Williams chops it on the ground toward third. Casey Blake throws across. That's the end of the inning, but more damage put on the board by LSU. They are now up nine to one over Wichita State. Game four of the College World Series. The College World Series is over. Several of his own players and several guys on the other squads here will be going to the Olympic team tryouts. Of course, he can't. It uh, would be a time for anyone else of great excitement just thinking about participating in that event, but he can't do it right now. He's got to have focus all his attention on his club right here. Well, the thing that was amazing to me, he said that there are around 40 plus invitees, and he has to cut them cut down to 25 by June. What was it? The end of June, I guess. And, and then, then he has 20. Then to 20. I mean, that's what's amazing. I mean, so he's got to cut his squad basically in half. And they're going to be a lot of deserving position players who are not going to make that squad and be very disappointed not being part of the Olympic team. If he keeps eight pitchers, that means he's only got 12 other guys he can keep. So you're looking for people who can play more than one position. Three and one to Travis Wyckoff leading off the Wichita State fifth. He's walked and grounded out. Files this one back out of play. Nineteen ninety-three, Travis Wyckoff was the starting pitcher in the championship game for Wichita State against LSU, and he gave up that home run, which helped the Tigers win the national championship game. Wyckoff drives, draws a walk here to start the fifth. And Wichita State, even though we're in the bottom of the fifth, slowly running out of time if they're going to make any kind of a comeback. You're right. I mean, you can't, you're down eight runs. You have to start getting one here, two there. You can't just look for the big inning because you are running out of time. Casey Blake stands in one for two tonight. Nice job by Lanier to go up and spear that one. He goes out and has something to say to Eddie Yarnell. Blake singled his last time up. That was in the third inning. And singles again through the hole between Dunn and Williams. So a walk and a base hit has runners at first and second with nobody out here in the Wichita State fifth. Well, if you're a Yarnell, you want to make sure you do not walk anyone, although he walked Wyckoff here. 
you want to try to keep the ball on the ground, keep the ball in the ballpark, but make them hit the ball. Adam McCullough. This could be two. Williams to Morris to Furness, and Furness could not get down in the bag in time. He protested the call, thought he had a double play. Well, I think he feels like he got back to it. He knew he missed it the first time, but he went back after it a couple of times, and he had plenty of time to get it. We'll take a throw. The throw is high. Now watch. He will catch the ball. Now he knows he's off the bag there, and now he reaches back. He Ooh, does get he the corner it. of the bag, and he thought he had it anyway. Watch right there. He gets the corner of the bag. That's a break for Wichita State. Runners at first and third, one gone. Instead of a runner at third with two out for D.H. Jeff Ryan, who was 0 for 2, called out on strikes and then struck out swinging. He has had no luck against Eddie Yarnell. See, that's why you can't anticipate a double play. Because you otherwise you'd say the guy made a high throw to first base. But you don't know what the umpire is going to call. <laughs> Missed with that one, one and one. Twelve base runners tonight for the Shockers, and only one has been able to cross the plate. They have had their opportunities. Ryan dumps one into right field. That's a base hit. Wyckoff scores. McCullough is on his way to third. And it's seven to two. Ryan gets his first College World Series RBI. Well, this is definitely an aluminum bat hit here because he got jammed, but he gets enough of it to get it over the infield. And it's a base hit. The inside outs the ball as well, but it's a base hit. Drives in a run and moves the runner to third base. Nine to two with one out. Runners at first and third for Jerry Stein, who doubled his first time up. Struck out his last trip. And action in the Wichita State bullpen. Or, excuse me, in the LSU bullpen. And Skip Bertman will not let this rally go on forever without doing something. Estevez is the man heating up. And now he's got some company. Chris DeMoria is in the bullpen also. DeMouye is the left-hander. One and one to Jerry Stein. We're in the bottom of the fifth. 9-2 LSU. But Wichita State with another rally. Two and one. Yarnell is still throwing well. I mean, he should have had the double play, which they didn't turn. He jammed the next hitter, which became a blue single. So it's not like he's they're beating him all around the ballpark. Poured that one in there, two and two. And he's still up around 89 miles an hour, which is basically where he was at the beginning of the ball game. And that was his 99th pitch. Another good stop by Lanier. Three two to Jerry Stein. Foul back. Stein just trying to stay alive. Well, again, if you're Wichita State, you have to try to make sure you get one here, one there. So if he can put the ball in play, that'll get one run home. And there have been a couple of times tonight they have failed to do just that. Hits it in the air to left. Cooley retreating back to the wall. Makes the catch. McCullough will score from third. And Cooley had a tough time with that ball. It nearly got over his head. 
but he battled it and got back to the wall to make the catch. Well, he actually makes a really nice play here because the ball is hit directly over his head, and that is the toughest play to make. Now watch, he goes straight back. He's not running at any angle. That ball is straight over his head, and he makes the play. Nice play there by Cooley. Stein thought he might have had something going here. He's a little bit upset, but at least he got the one run home. Got the RBI on the sacrifice fly, and Cooley has the kind of skills he could play center field. Even though he's in left right now, they'll appeal at second base and won't get anything out of it. And it's 9-3. What they're appealing is that the runner at first, Ryan, had passed second base and did not tag it going back after the catch was made by Cooley in left field. With two out, Nathan Reese, who has struck out and grounded out, stands in. The other thing about the catch Cooley made, he was playing quite shallow in left field for Stein and had a long way to run. He may have been a little deceived by the fact that the wind is not blowing in from left field like it was at the beginning of the ball game. Strike call to Nathan Reese, two and one, with Ryan down at first, two gone, and two runs in for Wichita State. Big swing and a miss, two and two. Reese has occasional power, five home runs this year. Hit one in the regional. Guy comes to play. Hits this one in the air down a right field line. It's twisting foul. Bowles is over there and won't be able to get it. Take a look at the play that they appeal. Ryan was at first base. When the ball is hit, now if Ryan goes past second base, he has to tag it on the way back. He stops short. And I can't tell whether he touched the bag or not, but if he didn't touch it, it doesn't matter. You don't have to touch it as long as you do not go past the bag. You could tell the umpire was also paying very close attention yes. there. Doing their job. Chopped on the ground toward Nathan Dunn. Throws across and got Nathan Reese. Wichita State puts two on the board in the home half of the fifth, but they're still down 9-3. Improved this place, and it's just a wonderful sight to see. I mean, I certainly haven't been uh, in more than a handful of them, but this is the nicest minor league ballpark I've ever been to. Yeah, well, they've made this a fantastic venue here. I mean, and it fits this series perfectly. To me, this is like the Final Four in basketball and everything else they do in college. I, I mean, this is just great. I mean, the kids have, like you say, the time of their life, and they have a memories that will they'll keep with them for the remainder of their lives. And I'm really glad that the NCAA has resisted whatever temptation there has been to move oh, it to an indoor stadium with 55,000 seats in a major city. It, it's perfect for right here. No, I, I think it would not be the same if it was not here in right. Omaha. I mean, this is kind of the home of the College World Series. And I'm, I'm sure the coaches would tell you the same thing, that they would not want to move. Mike Kerner leads it off in the sixth, chops that one foul. He's two for three, single twice, and then lined to center field his last time up. You have been here recently, but I had not been here for quite a while. And I mean, it's big just changes. Huh? Yeah, big changes, all for the better. Well, I know we don't miss the press box. Strike three. <laughs> Kerner's gone. Rightfully so. They made all the other improvements before they changed the press box. I mean, uh, you know, we're the last people that really need to be served. Let's be honest about it. I take care of the fans first. Sure. Yeah. And the people who are here to see their kids. I think this is, but again, this is just a great facility. Not that we're not grateful. Heaven knows we are. We're, <laughs> we're just delighted with this facility. Nathan Dunn toward the hole. Stabbed by Hooper. Can't come up and make the throw. 
Gave it his best shot, diving into the outfield grass, but couldn't handle it when he came up to try to throw him out. Well, the most difficult thing about making that play is getting up quickly to your feet and being able to make a throw. He made the dive right there, but he really never caught it cleanly. But he gave it a good try. Gave it the full extension, didn't he? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Furnace, who really hasn't had a chance to show you his hitting prowess as yet. Takes a called strike. He is 0 for 2 with a walk. Called out on strikes and grounded to short. And his average has dropped down to a measly 378. <laughs> You're on TV. Bauer misses outside 1 and 1. Mike Patrick, Joe Morgan, Larry Conley, our entire ESPN crew with you from Omaha, Nebraska. Glad you could join us on the deuce for this one. Dunn, who has 18 steals this year over at first. But you want to give this guy an opportunity to hit. Second for one, back to first, not in time. Nice play by Adam McCullough. Came up and threw a strike to shortstop Zach Sorensen. Well, he threw a bullet to Zach. <laughs> yeah, he did. But it was a nice play. He comes off the bag. Now he, he makes up his mind. He's going to second base. Now he, he fires this ball to Sorensen, and Sorensen fires it back to the first base. And not quite in time. Bauer did a good job of getting over there. Yeah, it sure was. This one smoked to left field by Cooley. In there for the base hit. The senior from Lake Charles, Louisiana, jumped on the first pitch and drove it to left center. So two on and two out. The tenth hit of the ball game for the Tigers of LSU. Gene Stevenson making another trip to the mound. Well, it looks like to me that maybe he's going to bring Wyckoff in the pitch. Because, yeah, I think that's what they're going to do. Wyckoff, the left fielder, slowly walking in. And Ryan is warming up in anticipation of coming in to be the new left fielder. I guess the question I would have here, because I'm not as versed in the college rules as I was before, is does he get eight pitches to warm up, or how many does he get? He's got to get the minimum. Well, that's what I mean. That's, I'm just wondering. He had warmed up at the start of the inning. Well, he gets his pitcher's glove, gives away his outfielder's glove. And we'll check out Wyckoff's stats when we come back. For the very first time, up to left field. I like guys like that. Yeah. I'm ready. Let's I'm ready. play. Yeah. See, I'm not going to get any better here warming up. <laughs> <laughs> two out, two on for Brad Wilson. Wyckoff starts him off with an inside fastball. Wilson is one for three. With an RBI, he singled in third, scored himself on Lanier's grand slam homer. I think this move is made not just to get the hitter out, but also he doesn't want Bauer to throw too many pitches because if they lose and go into the loser's bracket, you have to have all your weapons ready just to stay in, this, stay in the running here in the College World Series. So I'm sure that... He's thinking ahead. He's not thinking past this game, but he's thinking ahead to what can happen down the road. Bauer threw 55 pitches right. during his stint. Ah! And certainly one he would like to have back. 
One and two to Wilson. Bauer already has the elbow iced up. Struck him out. So Wyckoff comes in from left and does his job with two runners on. He strikes out Brad Wilson. Will go to the bottom of the sixth. LSU still up by half a dozen. All right. LSU on top, nine to three. Lanier with a grand slam for LSU, and Eddie Yarnell has gone five innings with five strikeouts. Jason Williams for LSU led off the game with a home run, and they are up by six as we go to the bottom of the sixth. Zach Sorensen stands in. And you can see Yarnell is still throwing hard. Estevez and Demouye warming up again in the bullpen. Demouye is the left-hander. Sorensen with a 2-1 count. He is 0 for 1 in the opening game of the series. Skies it down the right field line. Bowls into foul territory and stumbled over the pitcher's mound down in the bullpen. Hopefully he's all right. Yeah. Showing total disregard for himself. Just went roaring after it. Well, he's young and strong. <laughs> Not going to stay young if he does that many more times. Well, watch. He hits the mound, so you're running uphill now, and he just wasn't aware that he that next step was going to be elevated. And he, right there, he strips. And luckily, he falls before he gets to the wall, and he seems to be okay. 2-2. Two -two, hit on the ground. Nice pick by Furnace at first. He'll make the play himself. Good defense by Eddie Furnace down at first base. Two thousand here tonight, a single game record, really enjoying themselves at Rosenblatt Stadium. Kevin Hooper, two for two, trying to make it three for three, but Kerner will be able to track that one in center field. And Hooper is gone. Two gone quickly for Wichita State in their half of the sixth. Hooper's hit the ball pretty good three times tonight. Center fielder Randy Young takes a strike. He is one for two. Struck out swinging his last time up in the fourth. Oh, and two from Yarnell. I think every time they get up in the bullpen, Yarnell decides, <laughs> I want to stay in. He starts throwing better. Wasted a high fastball outside, one and two. Pitch count now up to 117. Missed with another fastball, high and outside. He really hasn't shown any signs of being tired, though, no, has he, Joe? No, he has not. And he's pitched well. I mean, he's sure throwing has. the ball well. He's in control. Three and two, and he certainly made the quality pitches when he's had to. Well, that's the sign of, the, of a good pitcher being able to make the pitch under pressure and when you're in a flex situation. Three two, just missed with a fastball. Boy, he wanted that call. So did Skip Burtman. Just throws up his hands. Well, he also went from 0 and two to four and two. I mean, yeah. <laughs> with all fastballs, he got quickly ahead at 0 and two, but he could not put him away. That is the fifth walk 
Yarnell has issued to go along with five strikeouts. And Wyckoff comes up with Young at first. Remember the last time? Down big, Young was stealing anyway. I think we're past that now. We're in the sixth <laughs> inning. You're running out of outs. You can't afford to expend them on the base pass. When it was early in the ball game, I could understand that. But I think we're at a point now where you're going to have to hit, hit your way through this. You're not going to be able to steal your way through it or hit and run. You're going to have to put some bats on the ball. You've only got 10 outs left. And you don't want to give two or three of them away running the bases. Wyckoff 0 for 1. Big cut didn't get it 1 and 2. I'll tell you what, not only did he not get it, that one was really, that may have been his hardest pitch of the night. That was that fastball got up there very quickly, and it was up. 88, right around where he was at the beginning. Another high fastball fouled off. And he was running on the pitch. The other thing about that 88 mile an hour fastball, when it's up, it's equivalent to a faster pitch because yes. you can't get your arms around right. as quick. No doubt about it, the high fastball is always faster than the low fastball. We might get an argument from a physics professor on that one, but it's true when you play baseball. Runner goes again, hit towards short. No play at second, but Bobble now, he's got to make the play at first and doesn't get it. So if Randy Young isn't running, it's an easy force at second base. Well, first of all, it becomes an easy play, you know, on the force out if the runner's not going. But like you said, when he's going, now you have to make the play cleanly. And he doesn't and ends up missing Wyckoff at first base. Jason Williams had only had 11 errors in 313 chances and extremely reliable as a shortstop. Young going for third, and he's in there. Boy, is that a gamble. I mean, there's two outs, and he's stealing third. You still need base hits. That's what I And see. with his speed, if you get a base hit, he's going to score anyway. Yeah, you're not going to be able to steal these six runs you need. You're going to have to hit. But he does get a great jump, and again, it's part of it because Yarnell is going he, he's concerned with the hitter, not so much as with the base runner. Lanier made a good throw. He did everything he could. Casey Blake takes it for a ball, one and one. Blake with 21 home runs this year, 97 RBIs, may get 98 as he gets one tonight, and has his average up to 353. This one weakly off the right side. Furnace is about five rows back. But all the statistics you just read are also the reason why you shouldn't be stealing third with two outs and six runs down. Let this guy swing the bat. Maybe he can bring you within three. Good point. And remember, I mean, you can steal bases and you get numbers and so forth and so on, but, you know, the real reason to steal a base is to help your team win. Well, I think uh, the delay in play is because a ball has come out of the stands. I think the other point, Joe, earlier when Young was stealing bases, I think it was a distraction to Yarnell. Yeah. And I think you made the point perfectly here. Yarnell could care less what right. Young is doing exactly. right now. They're two down. He knows he's not going to steal home. <laughs> he knows that. One and two to Casey Blake. Fastball just got a piece. This is a big point in the ball game. Yes. A double here would make it a four-run game, and you can come back from four. There's a single. Blake delivers. Randy Young scores. And it's nine to four. Wyckoff stopped at second as Justin Bowles got the ball back in in a hurry. Well, when you're up there with two strikes, all you're trying to do is make sure you put the ball in play. Fastball down and away, a beautiful pitch, but beautiful hitting there as he just takes the ball, goes the other way. 
And did you see on the replay, Yarnell throwing his hands up? Yeah. He knew what a great pitch he made. Well, he said, I made a great pitch, and the guy slaps it in the right field anyway. There's nothing I can do about it. Well, they're going to make the change, and Yarnell is not happy. Made a terrific pitch, and this will bring on Jake Estevez out of the bullpen. We'll check on him when we come back to the College World Series in Omaha. Welcome to Burger Rock. Championships in both baseball and basketball. And fortunately for us, there are a lot of stories like that at the College World Series. Yarnell is done. Five and two-thirds, nine hits, four runs. Three of them earned. Walked five and struck out five. Threw 130 total pitches. And Jake Estevez, the junior from Auburn, California, comes on. He had a sore arm last week. Pitched only one game in the regional and allowed two runs on four hits. Very good control. Has a good slider. And 67 strikeouts in 64 innings pitched. And this is Wichita State's best opportunity. Down 9-4, runners at first and second, two out. McCullough, who was one for three with a double, stands in. One swing of the bat, we could have a two-run game. And McCullough's second on the team with homers with 15. The wind right now blowing a little more straight out instead of to right field, maybe a little to right center, and not very strong. Well, if you're Skip Burton, all you want to do is maintain at least a five-run lead, a four-run lead, because we've seen grand slams all too often here. <laughs> McCullough hits it deep down the right field line, twisting foul, and that will go back in the seat. Well, I'm glad to see Bowles learned his lesson. He went over there that time, and he looked for that <laughs> mound before, right after he crossed the foul line. <laughs> A little smile from him out there in right field. One and one to Adam McCullough. Two out, two on. Bottom of the sixth. Down the right field line again, fading and foul. So McCullough hasn't been able to get around on two Estevez pitches, and he's in a one and two hole. Painich and Demouye continue to heat up in the bullpen. demouye has been up three different times. He's the lefty. One and two to McCullough. In the dirt. And Lanier had just done, done a superb job down there as a human backstop. Now watch how he, he just drops his entire body down in front of it. There's no place for that ball to get through. Well, he can go out for dinner with his parents tonight and say, Mom and Dad, I brought the whole game today, didn't I? <laughs> Did my usual job behind the plate. Got five ribbies and a grand slam. Two and two. Rip to short. Williams comes up. Makes the throw across the diamond. The rally ends. Wichita State gets one more on the board, but they're down nine to four. Back to the College World Series after this. Yeah. 10 and 2, 4, 9 and 1 for Wichita State as we go to the top of the seventh. This is an opening round game for both ball clubs. The winner advances, the loser falls into the loser's bracket and only one away from elimination here in this College World Series tournament. Justin Bowles, one for one tonight, currently hitting 301. Singled his first trip up, has walked the next two times, has scored all three times he's been to the plate.
Made second team all SEC this year as voted by the coaches. Travis Wyckoff is on for his second inning of relief. He came out of left field to end the last inning. Wyckoff strikes me as one of those guys that's the, the prototype college pitcher. He's just a battler. He wants the baseball. He wants to be out there. Well, I think you're right. He doesn't. He, he just wants to pitch. And it doesn't look like he has anything special other than a lot of heart and desire. And this brings up Tim Lanier, whose uh, legend grows by the moment. He went into the regional game against Georgia Tech with 25 RBIs for the season. He got five in that game. He has five in this game. So 10 of his 35 have come in two ball games in postseason. I'd move him up in the order. <laughs> Wyckoff is with, hot. Yeah. Wyckoff with an excellent pickup pickoff move goes over to Bowles to check him at first. Nobody out here in the seventh. Pitch got him swing. Lanier, a hometown product from Baton Rouge. Another checking throw to first. And no matter what he does with the bat, he has shown us the stuff behind the plate. Excellent defensive catcher. Wyckoff misses outside one and one, which normally means you have a future. There just aren't that many guys who you can describe as an excellent defensive catcher. Right. I think that's the quickest way to the major leagues is be a good defensive catcher or a pitcher that can throw hard. <laughs> Boy, it's easier to be a pitcher. Yeah. Nice save by McCullough. And a wry smile on the face of Travis Wyckoff, who nearly threw that one in the, down the right field line. Lanier takes it low, two and one. LSU has been ahead the entire ball game, one in the first, one in the second. Then they put up five in the third before Wichita State was able to respond. Here's the 2-1 to Lanier instead to throw over to first again. field line and Lanier certainly hasn't swung the bat tonight like a 249 hitter no he has not but most of the pitches he's hit have been on the inner half of the plate and now you see Wyckoff trying to stay away well if you're Lanier you got to be thinking I got him worried now <laughs> yeah they're pitching to me now <laughs> 2-2 two, two to the senior catcher instead another throw. Wyckoff the snap throw because of his versatility 
the All-American teams always include a utility player because he is a left fielder and a pitcher. He made second team All-American from collegiate baseball and the Smith Super Team as the utility player. High and outside, three and two. I think he's so worried about the runner at first base, Bowles, that he's losing a little bit of, of his concentration to the plate. Now it's three and two, and they probably will send Bowles. Hit off the fist towards second base. Hooper with a tough play at second. Back to first. Is it a double play out at second? Yes, he is. Bang, bang, play at second. Hooper really took a chance and went for the force, and Sorensen turned around and gunned it to McCullough. Well, what happened is the runner, Bowles, did not, he, he broke late. Now, he's running on the pitch, so he gets there. He thinks that he's going to be safe. He doesn't slide. Woohoo! Nice play there by... <laughs> Boy, he sure looks safe yeah, he on did. the replay. Well, but I mean... He should have slid. If he would have slid, it wouldn't have been any contest. Skip Bergman saying he looks safe in live action. Well, you can't well, really tell from that angle. I, I, you know, but he, if he would have slid, there would have been no doubt. Yeah. From that angle, it looked like a much closer play. Right. But not only that, though. Sometimes, I mean, the umpires, if you make the play properly, right. You know, you're safe. So. He just he was deceived because he did not think Hooper was coming to second base. I mean, you were in the vicinity of second base a few times on double yeah. plays, weren't you? Yes, in the vicinity. <laughs> <laughs> but just because you did it right to emphasize your point, you yeah. get the call. Yeah. Warren Morris stands in. He is one for two, doubled his last time up. The young man still not 100% after the surgery on his hand. Waved at that one and struck out. So the inning is over. We'll go to the bottom of the seventh. LSU still with a 9-4 lead on Wichita State. Very slow fight. <laughs> Jeff Ryan, who started as the DH and went to left, opens the inning with a screaming line drive to Jason Williams. One gone. That's what Wichita State needs. Hit the ball on the button, but they've got to find holes to hit it through, too. You're right. When you fall down, fall this far behind, you are really, let's just say, down to your last nine outs. You have to start making things happen, and no longer can they be content getting one run in the inning. They're going to have to have a big inning here. The final is in. In the hockey playoffs, the Florida Panthers will go to the finals. They win 3-1 tonight. Congratulations to them. I'm sure there are rats everywhere. An amazing hockey playoff. They beat Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh. Stunning. We are told the final is 3-1, and Florida will now play Colorado for the Stanley Cup. That's right. Who would have thunk it? I mean, that doesn't sound right, does it? The Stanley Cup Finals, Florida, Colorado. I was going to say, <laughs> definitely not what they were looking for. <laughs> Congratulations to both teams. I mean, they beat the Detroit. I mean, the, the Red Wings, who had the most wins in history. And the team that everyone else thought was maybe the best team. Yeah. The Penguins. And the Red Wings just continue their uh, historic frustration. Yeah. I mean, if, if you've grown up with hockey, you expect, you know, Montreal and right. another Canadian-sounding yeah. name to be in the finals, uh, not Florida and Colorado. Stein draws a walk with one out. Let's update you on what's happened in the College World Series so far. Alabama and Miami advanced in their bracket. Clemson and Oklahoma State, the losers in the first round, and they'll meet to see who's eliminated. Florida advanced this afternoon with a come-from-behind victory over Florida State. The winner of this one will meet Florida. The loser will go into the loser's bracket against the Seminoles of FSU. Nathan Reese 
takes a fastball high from Estevez. Reese, no luck tonight. Grounded out twice and fan. Chop back over the mound. They'll get the short out and throw it away. Estevez with a poor throw. And he had the slowest player on the field running. Even with the high chop, he had time to get him and threw it down the right field line. Well, the only way that Wichita is going to get back in this game is with some help from LSU. They've walked the hitter now, and now another error. So they are getting the help that they want. As you mentioned, Estevez had plenty of time. Now, he, he will take the ball. And just take, he actually took his time after he made the catch, but then he just threw the ball away. Now watch, he'll take his time right there. See, he takes enough time, and he just makes a bad, a poor throw. And he gets away from Furnace and goes down the right field line. Furnace didn't have a chance, so they're runners at second and third. And Estevez is gone, leaving runners at second and third with one out. Chris Demouye will be the new pitcher. We'll check him out when we come back. Skip Burton, you just cannot feel comfortable about this game because, again, the only way that Wichita is going to catch up is if you help them, and they're doing a lot to help them, making errors and walking hitters. There's the big breaker. It drops low and inside. Sorensen, 0 for 2. He has walked once tonight. Sorensen only 160 pounds. They used to knock the bat out of his hand. He's gotten a lot stronger as the season has gone along. And since he was recruited. One and one. Two and one. And you see the jugs gun with a 73 mile an hour breaking ball. That's a pretty big breaking ball because he has to start it up head high in order for it to keep him on the strike zone. Fastball missed high, three and one. A pitch away from loading them up. Can't be easy to be a head coach in this or any other sport. Here's the three one. Rolls it in line to left for a base hit. Stein is home. Reese will hold it third. The throw back to first, and Sorensen nearly ran himself into trouble. Nine, five. And here come the Shockers. Well, uh, you mentioned you described it perfectly. He just kind of grooved that he was trying to make sure he threw a strike three one. And Sorensen ripped it to left field for a base hit. Actually, the throw should have gone into second base anyway because that run in front of you do not, does not mean anything. And Reese is not going to try to score. No, it, it really doesn't mean anything. You do not want that other one to go to second base. Here's Kevin Hooper, two for three. The little guy has hit the ball hard. Big, big, big breaking ball in there for a strike. Has the average up to 317. Freshman from Lawrence, Kansas. State needs only one more base runner to be able to send up the potential tying hitter. Well, if you're the Shockers, really, you, you've gotten it where you would like to have it, meaning that one swing in the back and tie the ball game if you can get a grand slam. And you're down, that's what I was saying. If you're down by more than four, you can never catch up with one swing. 
fastball missed outside one and two. Chase a bad pitch and struck him out. Curveball down in the dirt. As a now two gone with runners at first and third. That is such a big breaking curveball that it's hard to lay off. And DeMaurier throws the breaking ball. See how low that is? And another good job by Lanier. Watch him. Watch how he gets down again to make sure that ball doesn't get through. Young right back to the mound. Demouye spears it and throws him out. So Demouye does a great job coming out of the bullpen and strands runners at first and third. Enjoying being here very much. Seeing lots of old friends, coaches, umpires, everyone. And it's been a memorable trip. I love Omaha. It's my 15th time. So it's a very special place in the hearts of all the Brock family members. Well, I know you also told me it's nice to be here without the stress. Absolutely, but I would trade it in a minute to have him back. Okay. Mike, she's a wonderful lady, and he was a terrific coach. And, Larry, that is a uh, wonderful tribute from that fine uh, lady to this event and to this city uh, to have her honor us with her presence tonight. And we thank you for uh, finding her and talking to her. Uh, I have to apologize to uh, Chris Demouye. I've been saying Demouye, and it's Demouye. You're leading me wrong again. Yes, I am. I'm getting us all in trouble tonight. Well, let me change my spelling here. <laughs> Demui. This is Jason Williams, who is one for four tonight. The thing that has kept Wichita in this ball game, Mike, is the fact that. LSU has committed three errors and issued six bases on balls. That is what has kept Wichita State in the ball game and has helped them to get back into the ball game. Shut up. Williams at first to bring up Kerner, the sophomore from Turnersville, New Jersey, to face Travis Wyckoff, who was two for four. His average currently 314. Center fielder looking to get something started here in the eighth. LSU would like to pad its lead again after seeing it trimmed to four. This kid has a bright future, too. 300-plus hitter, power. Pop this bunt in the air. Reese got there. One gone. And Kerner really upset with himself that he didn't get that one down. Well, not a bad idea because, you know, if any, you try to add one more run here, if you possibly can, get it back to where one swing cannot tie the ball game. And if he could have bunted him over, maybe they could have gotten a base hit by Dunn or someone to add that one more run. Third baseman Nathan Dunn, one out of four, and a run scored tonight with one out and one off. Nathan Dunn had wanted to call time on that pitch, and he backed out, and they called a strike. One and one. Oh, you, can, you can see he's trying to call time, but he waited too long. Pitcher was already into his motion. All you can do is ask for it. You right. don't, just by motioning for it, you don't get it. And the umpire thought it was too late. And part of the reason for that is to stop you from jumping out of the batter's box and maybe stopping the pitcher in a mid-motion and hurt it, you know, hurting the pitcher. Yeah. 
one and one to Nathan Dunn. Inside two and one. And this is Brandon Looper. Or Braden Looper, excuse me, the outstanding closer for Wichita State. A certain high draft choice. Ripped foul. And you, you know that Gene Stevenson has got to be thinking, you know, we're within four now. We can't let it get back up there again. That's exactly right. Again, you know, it may seem like you're only talking about one run, but you can load the bases and one swing can tie the ball game, whereas you fall five runs behind, it's just more difficult, obviously, to catch up. It's tough to hit those five-run homers. Yeah, I've never seen one. Two and two to Dunn. And a weak swing as he jammed him with a fastball and struck him out. Good fastball on the inside part of the plate. And you see him shorten his arms trying to get to that fastball inside, but Dunn can't catch up with it. Looks like a cut fastball there from Wyckoff. Third strikeout for Wyckoff, the eighth for the Wichita State pitching staff. If the Shockers lose this ball game, they'll look back on all the runners they've left on base 12 through seven innings, especially early in the ball game, and they had a couple of opportunities. Furness is grounded out twice and was called out on strikes. He walked his second time up. Fouls that one out of play. Came into the College World Series with a 381 batting average. And is the only LSU starter now without a hit. He'd be the last guy you would think would be in that situation. foul 0 and 2. Sometimes the pressure on the so-called superstars right. is even greater. Well it, that happens in the Major League World Series. Sometimes the big guys go in and they're concentrating so hard on them they forget about the other guys. But I mean you cannot afford not to give 100 percent concentration to hitters like Furnace and Burrell. These Burrell these guys are great hitters. Off speed on 0 and 2 pop foul that'll reach the seats. But I think as this series goes along, World Series goes along, you'll see the cream rise to the top. I mean, that's what happens. And yeah, the big guys relax a little bit. Uh, as you mentioned, guys like Furnace and Burl and J.D. Drew from Florida State, the guys who have uh, stardom stenciled on their foreheads. Check swing struck him out. Wichita State has closed within four runs, and they keep it there as we go to the bottom of the eighth. Third, two in the bottom of the fifth, one each in the sixth and seventh, and Demui will face Travis Wyckoff to start the eighth. Wyckoff 0 for 2. He's walked twice and was safe on an error. So he's reached base three times. Came in hitting 4-10. in 3-0. Demui had walked 22 in 65 innings of work. So he has pretty good control. Got that one in, 3-1. Well, again, they have really helped the Shockers by issuing bases on balls and errors in the last couple of innings just to keep them in this game. And there's another one. Wyckoff gets the free pass. And if you are tuning in on the deuce, expecting to see auto racing, it's coming up next, the Allison Legacy Race on ESPN2. 
We invite you to stay tuned for that, but we have a ways to go here. We're in the bottom of the eighth. Wyckoff down at first is the 20th Wichita State base runner tonight. But they've only produced five runs. This is Casey Blake. Blake, three for four, reached on an error, and then three straight singles to raise his average to 355. Starting his 164th straight game for Wichita State coming in tonight. Didn't care for that call at all. Well, he thought it was high. So did James Stevenson down at first ba third base. Check throw to first. One and one to Casey Blake. Hits it to deep right center field. Goodbye. Casey Blake just hit his team leading 22nd home run. And folks, we have a two-run ball game. Well, Yogi would have loved it out here because <laughs> it's right. never over till it's over. Well, it appeared to be a changeup. He slowed his delivery down, and it was a changeup. Yes, and it was up. And Blake hit it well to right field and, and just carried right on into the stand. Boy, and the flags are dead still in yeah. center field. The wind didn't help that a lick. The thing that helped it was up. The changeup was up, and he drilled it. 9-7. Blake now four out of five with four RBIs. And Patrick Coogan will be the new pitcher as Demui is done for the night. Both skippers are now trying to pull out all the stops to get this first victory. Coogan 5-0 with a save this year. Second on the staff in innings pitched, even though he has a 4.14 ERA. He's seen 91 strikeouts in 76 innings. And only 26 walks. But Mike, we've talked about so often, this first ball game is so important to go into the winner's bracket rather than the loser's bracket. So they are going to pull out all stops to try to win this ball game. And all DeMuy can do right now is become a cheerleader for his club. He did pitch pretty well yeah, in relief. But that two-run homer will uh, leave a sour taste in his mouth. Still nobody out here in the eighth. And a two-run ball game. And Casey Blake now has pushed his average up to 359 with a four for five opening game performance in the College World Series. And if you're Skip Burtman, you're trying to figure out how I can keep him from hitting again. <laughs> well, he's got to face McCullough, Ryan, and Stein right now. Jeremy Moore is the new first baseman. I like that. Just come in and throw a strike. McCullough, one for four. Come in and throw two of them. That's even better. <laughs> Well, what you look for is when the game starts to get tight like this, some pitchers come in there a little, try to be a little too fine. Struck him out on three pitches. The 
and probably wondering why didn't I bring him in a little sooner. <laughs> this is a perfect 0 and 2 pitch. You're ahead in the count 0 and 2. You get him to chase the breaking ball off the outside corner. There you can see that is excellent rotation there on the breaking ball. 92 strikeouts on the year for Patrick Coogan. That's number two on the staff. He's a sophomore from Baton Rouge. Now facing Ryan, who was one for four. Single off of Wyckoff in the fifth. Swing and a miss. <laughs> Missed outside with a fastball, two and one. This is Mike Coogan, the father of the pitcher, Patrick. We get some good shots from there. Missed with a fastball, three and one. Stein is on deck with one out. He would represent the tying run if Ryan could get aboard. Missed high with a fastball. I don't think Dad got a picture of that one. If he did, he's not going to keep it. Jerry Stein comes to the plate for Gene Stevenson, representing the potential tying run here in the bottom of the eighth in a 9-7 ball game. Stein officially one for two, walked his last time up, has a double and an RBI and a long sacrifice fly. Well, the one thing you want to do if you're Coogan is, is try to get ahead of the hitters as he did on the first one, and you can get some help from them. But if you fall behind, they're not going to chase pitches out of the strike zone. Fastball in there. Well, he came out of the bullpen and threw three as uh, as three as good of pitches as you could possibly hope to throw the first hitter. He was probably a little tight, and then he relaxed <laughs> after he got the first hitter. One and one to Stein. Straight away center field. Kerner drifts to right center, makes the catch two gone. And that'll leave it up to the catcher. Nathan Reese, the number seven man in the order. A Wichita State could have folded its tent early, but they have hung in there and scratched, as you said. You need a run here, a run there, oh, maybe two here. That's exactly what they've done, and they're back within two here in the bottom of the eighth. Reese has drawn the collar tonight. He is 0 for 4. Another good stop by Lanier. Gets those knees down quickly so that there's no wicket for the ball to go through. You see a lot of guys just sort of lean that way and reach with a glove. Ball high, two and up. Coogan used to be a starter, moved to the bullpen. Pours that one in there for a fastball. And in strikeouts per inning, or strikeouts per game, 10.77 strikeouts per nine inning. That's 11th in the NCAA stats this year. So he can bring it. Strike two, the runner goes, the throw not in time. So Ryan steals second, only his third steal of the season. Lanier has made good throws on every steal tonight and really not had a chance on anybody. Well, he didn't have much of a chance here because the Coogan has a pretty big windup. He kicks the leg way behind him. But Lanier comes up and fires a strike, but you can see how late it is. Oh, struck him out. Coogan does the job much to the light of his father. We go to the ninth in a two-run game. LSU still on top. 22,000 plus and nobody's leaving yet. LSU on top two runs as we go to the ninth. The Allison Legacy Race coming up following our broadcast here from the College World Series. 
the line score you can see is Wichita State has fought to get back into this ball game. Coming up right after our broadcast, we'll go to auto racing. Line back up the middle off of the hand of Wyckoff. Pulled McCullough off the back. Great job by Wyckoff just to get his glove on the ball. It was a bullet back through the middle. He knocked it down, but it rolled too far away from him to make the play. Cooley just blistered it. Watch, he does a great job of just getting his glove on it. Again, this is a, look at this. This is a bullet back through the middle, and he just reaches out and gets his glove on it, and even even moving out of the way. But by the time he picks it up, Cooley is at first base. Brad Wilson, one for four, stands in. LSU seems to have threatened in every inning. Cooley with good speed down at first. Strike call, 0 and 2 to Wilson. something off and missed outside one and two <laughs> Wyckoff the senior from Arkansas City Kansas <laughs> struck him out Wilson couldn't catch up with a high fastball one gone here in the ninth Real good fastball there by Wyckoff, and as you mentioned, up in the strike zone, and Wilson could not catch up with it. He kind of drops down a little bit too, sidearm to the left-hander, and that fastball up around the letters. And you can see over the outer part of the plate too. Good pitch, good spot. Wyckoff has not allowed a run in two and two-thirds innings, and has struck out five. Not bad for a left fielder, huh, Joe? No, not bad. You're right. And a left fielder that can hit. All-American utility player. Bowles officially one for one. He's walked three times tonight and has scored three times. LSU hanging on to a two nothing or a two run lead nine seven chopped foul into the dugout and it bounced out and a nice souvenir behind the first base dugout of the LSU Tigers. to Justin Bowles. The Wyckoff hung a breaking ball inside and he just really turned on it. Couldn't keep it fair. Looking ahead to the bottom of the ninth, it'll be the bottom of the order of the eight and nine men, Sorensen and Hooper, but they have three hits between them and seven trips. Struck him out, the runner goes, throw to second, not in time. He had a great jump, I mean, no chance at all for Reese on that place. So a runner at second and two out, and Gene Stevenson is going to come out to talk to Wyckoff. I don't 
think you can afford to walk him, walk him to pitch to Mars, so you can't afford to put another run on base, so he's going to go ahead and make the change. Well, Tim Lanier's got to be thinking of I earned a lot of respect tonight. I mean, they go out, they have conferences about me, and now they're even changing pitchers to go after me. Back in a moment. Sprint's dime a minute rate is getting rave reviews. Sprint Sense is great. I can call my sister in Kansas for only 10 cents a minute. Back to uh, left field after doing a great job. Three innings, gave up only one hit, fan six. And he will give way to the nation's premier closer, Braden Looper, the junior from Mangum, Oklahoma. And just watching this kid warm up. Gets up there in a heartbeat, doesn't it, Joe? Yeah, he's throwing very hard, has a good breaking ball as well, so he can be doubly tough on you. Tim Lanier has been the hitting star of this ball game. In the third inning, it was his grand slam that broke it open. A 245 hitter coming into the ball game. He has had five RBIs, including four on one swing in this game. Two for three, has the average up to 255. It was his fifth homer of the season. And as we told you earlier, he said five RBIs in this game, had five RBIs in the NCAA regionals against Georgia Tech. But he'll be facing some nasty stuff right now from Braden Looper, first team All-American on everybody's All-American team. They're expected to go very high in the amateur draft this coming week. Fastball pops in there at 95. Real hard and over the outside corner as well. Another fastball and fouled out of play by Lanier. He is certain to be on Skip Bertman's Olympic team when the College World Series is over. Skip Bertman will root just as hard for him as he possibly can, but right now, uh-uh, <laughs> not today. No, he'd like to see him get shelled right here. 62 strikeouts in 54 innings missed outside and if you're a catcher like Nathan Reese if that ball is seven eight inches off the plate you better have some good reactions to go get it or it's to the backstop you can't just slide out there and this low with a breaking pitch two and two does what he's expected to do. Strikes out his man to get to the bottom of the ninth. 9-7 LSU leading Wichita State. The Shockers with one more crack at it here in the bottom of the ninth. The 50th anniversary of the College World Series will continue on Monday. Another exciting twin bill with Flora facing the winner of tonight's game in the winner's bracket in game seven. That's on ESPN at 3.30 in the afternoon Eastern. Then a do-or-die elimination game between Florida State and the team that loses this battle, the winner moves on, the loser goes to 0-2 Barbecue. Both games on ESPN Monday. Zach Sorensen, the number eight hitter, one for three. He's also walked. Got his hit in his last at-bat. Hit to deep right field, way back. your fourth home run of the year of your college career even Zach Sorensen jumped all over it well it looks like he's gonna make a change but this fastball is right there 
And there was no doubt in my mind Coogan was trying to get out in front. He didn't want to walk anybody. He did have a two-run lead, and being honest, it takes two solo homers to tie you. So he throws a fastball, and Sorensen jumps all over it. You can see the reaction of Skip Bertman. Not real happy. The Shockers were down 7-0 in this game. Now it's 9-8. Home plate umpire Randy Crystal is going to come out to break this up. And Wichita State, only the biggest comeback they've had this year against Kansas State. They were down three, came back to win at 10-9. But with their record, 54-9, they haven't been behind that often either. Well, I actually like this situation where he's leaving Coogan in. I mean, me too. He was going out there to try to throw a strike, and he threw one. Yeah, and I mean, he's thrilled scoring strikes. I, I like, I like this guy. Kevin Hooper, the number nine man, will stand in. The freshman, two out of four. Breaking ball in there. Struck out his last time up and faces an 0-2 count right now. After Hooper, we'll go back to the top of the order. Breaking ball just dropped low. Mike Coogan watching his son Patrick, hoping he can close it out. Boy, a very late swing and just got the bat on. But that's what you're supposed to do. Waste the ones you can't hit till they give you one you can. Painage and Ship are in the bullpen. Ooh, 2-2. Two, two. Well, you saw the indication by the umpire that it was outside. Hooper representing the tying run. Fastball way too high. 3-2. They got their attention in the Wichita State dugout now. Went after a high fastball. Would have been ball four and just caught a piece to send it foul. But it's hard to lay off those pitches. Yes, <laughs> Especially with two strikes. And it's got to be getting a little tight down there. Bottom of the ninth College World Series. Smallest player ever to put on a Wichita State uniform, and he draws a free pass. Well, if you haven't been with us a long time for the College World Series, we'll give you some free advice. Never go away when it's 7 nothing. And Skip Bertman is going to have to go to his bullpen again. Well, I, I'm a little disappointed he got, Coogan got Hooper 0-2 and, and walked him from that position. You just can't do that. You've got to make him put the ball in play. Biggest lead of the night for LSU was 9-1. to one. Now it's 9-8. to eight. We'll be back to check out the pitching change right after this. Stay with us at the College World Series. 9-8 LSU, Wichita State attempting to rally here in the bottom of the ninth. Coming up tomorrow, the 50th year of the College World Series, and it's time to look back at some of the most memorable moments of all. Join us tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern on ESPN for some great memories of this terrific event. Both teams have used up a lot of pitchers tonight. This is Kevin Schiff, the junior from Pride, Louisiana. Only his fifth relief appearance this year. He'd had 10 starts. Early in the season, he had tendonitis in his shoulder and came back to finish fourth in the SEC with a 2.39 ERA. He is the fifth LSU pitcher for Skip Bertman. Hooper on at first. He can run. And the top of the order with Randy Young. 
who was one for three with a pair of walks. Well, the question is, what do you do if you're Gene Stevenson? Do you bunt? <laughs> do you hit and run? Or do you just let him steal the base outright? Stolen 12 out of 15. Young indicated he might bunt. Instead takes the called strike. For the pressure on these head coaches. I think it's far more than on the players. At least the players can play. <laughs> Pitch out, nothing happening. So the wheels turning in both dugouts. Well, I think it was a good call to have a pitch out, except he didn't stop. So he didn't really give the guy a chance to go anyway. Wichita State has already stolen three bases tonight. Cooper doesn't have a huge lead over there. Young tries to bunt, but pushes it foul down the line, one and two. That looked more like a bunt trying for a base hit rather than making sure he could sacrifice it. Well, I still think he was just trying to get it down any way he could because you got Wyckoff on deck. And you know they're not going to walk him if you butt the runner to second base. Because he would represent the winning run. One and two to Randy Young. says no swing on the appeal and it's two and two boy was that close a tempting breaking ball on the outside part of the plate definitely outside part of the plate and from this angle it looked like he was able to stop his swing. it did take a look at it from what the first base umpire saw yeah he kept his he kept the barrel back Another throw over. Hooper has to dive back again. This is why all these seniors came back for Wichita State for a chance to win games like this and have a shot at the World Series championship. Hooper's going to need a new uniform in a minute. Skip Burtman calling the pitches. I don't think you can afford to pitch out here even if you think they're going. He goes. The ball's chopped foul. Young stays alive at the plate. Nobody out of runner on bottom of the ninth. One run already in on the leadoff homer. Is this fun or what? This is a, this is a great atmosphere. Hooper stretching his lead at first, close to the cutout. And Ship throws over again. Breaking pitch chopped away, and Young is just hanging in there at the plate. The only other thing to remember, if the runner goes and there's a line drive, it's an easy double play. So people would, at home are wondering why don't they run every pitch. Well, get a line drive, a double play, and you're pretty much out of this inning. The next two scheduled batters, Wyckoff, who's averaging 407, and Blake with 22 homers. So if you're Wichita State, if you have to come back, you couldn't have drawn it up any better to have this part of the lineup. Here's a chopper towards short. Williams hesitated. Couldn't make up his mind whether he wanted to take two more steps and try to get it in the air and actually let the ball play him. With 11 errors and 313 chances on the season, he's made two tonight. Well, he just hesitated was the main thing. See, right there, he hesitated. Now he decides I better go get it. And if he would have started right away, it would have been an easy short hop and maybe a double play, but definitely would have been able to get one. 
So Young represents the tying run. It's or Hooper represents the tying Young at second. Tying run at second. Young at first would be the winning run, and Travis Wyckoff the hitter. Uh, I don't think he's going to bunt. In fact, Stevenson just went down and turned his back. We have already had ninth inning fireworks. Alabama won it in the ninth in the opening game yesterday. Wyckoff 0 for 2 tonight. He has walked three times. And he did square around. In the dirt again. Lanier blocked it again. Actually, if he does get the bunt down, this would bring up Casey Blake with all that power. And you might want to walk Blake. He's not going to matter. And pitch to McCullough. Yeah. Well, you would definitely do that. Wyckoff looking down to Gene Stevenson to get the sign. One and oh, the count. Kevin Ship trying to save it. Breaking ball in there. that he's trying to see if Wyckoff indicates whether he's bunting or not when he turns and makes that first motion. Wyckoff bunts this one toward third. That's where they'll go and they get the force on Hooper. Fine play there. Ship fielded his position very well. Well, this is probably the best play they've made all night, the best decision that they have made. Wyckoff bunts the ball down the third baseline, but of course, Ship comes and gets it, and Dunn gets back to the bag in plenty of time to give him a good target. This will bring up the hitting star, Casey Blake. Four for five, a home run, four RBIs. He has been on base all five times tonight. In the dirt, and this one gets away from Lanier. The runners go to second and third. Now let's see if LSU decides to put Blake on on purpose. That may have been a bad break for Wichita State. Well, this one, not it, no way Lanier could stop that when it actually hit the corner of the plate and bounced away from him. And you're right, they are going to walk. Blake, as we suspected. So this would have been the same basis. result as the sacrifice, Joe, if that yes. worked. So Blake will have reached base every time he's come up tonight. And it will put it squarely on the shoulders of Adam McCullough, who was one for five, a double in the third inning. A base hit could win the game. A double play could end it. Tell you what, they're squeezing every ounce of emotion out of this one. Now, if you're Gene Stevenson, what are you telling Adam McCullough? Well, first of all, if I was Gene Stevenson, I wouldn't have talked to him. <laughs> uh, I believe that, you know, he, he needs to be gathering his own thoughts about going to the plate. He put too many thoughts in his mind when he goes up there. He's thinking about what the coach told him. He's thinking about the situation. You think about too many things. How about go get a hit, kid? Yeah, that's, I think he knew what he was supposed to do when they decided to walk Casey Blake. Thomas is on deck to pinch hit for Looper should the inning remain alive at that point. 
McCullough, the first baseman, used to be a catcher, doesn't run well. Certainly a double play candidate if he hits it on the ground. Fouled it back. One and two. Well, you can't afford to play the infield in anyway because if the ball goes through, you lose the ball game. So you have to stay back. You let them have the tying run if you have to, but you make sure you knock the ball down and do not let it go through. So if you miss the double play by half a step, that's okay. But if you play in too tight, cut down your range, you can lose the ball game. McCullough is a tough out if he doesn't try to pull everything. Takes a fastball outside, two and two. All he wants to do is hit it hard somewhere. A sacrifice fly ties it. That's what I say, preferably in the air. Jerked it deep, but foul. He got one up in his eyes, just spun on it. There you see the LSU Tigers trying to pull for a ground ball or a strikeout. McCullough, number two on the team in homers and RBIs. Struck him out. Kevin Schiff with a beautiful breaking ball. This is a slider that starts over the outside part of the plate and breaks away, and that's a perfect pitch in that situation with two strikes on you. It's hard to lay off, and you see those Tigers are all fired up. And a very good hitter comes in as a pinch hitter, Ben Thomas. With the bases loaded, two out, bottom of the ninth, 328 average. Injured a couple of different ways this year, or he would have had far many more at-bats, only 122 on the season and two homers. That's twisting foul back into the stands, one and one. Well, it's the essence of baseball. With the bases loaded, bottom of the ninth, two outs, and you're behind by a run. You either deliver and win the game or don't, and it's over. Hit the deep right center field. Turner going back, has a beat on it, makes the catch. LSU wins nine. Thomas brought him to their feet with a line drive. But Kerner had room in center. The final 9-8 LSU over Wichita State. For Joe Morgan, Larry Conley.